Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to chair the second day of our conference, GASTERM 2022. I'd like to welcome all attendees of our proceedings today, especially younger colleagues representing the gas sector. I've been working in the PGNG group for more than 40 years. The Euripides statement who once said that success is the result of proper decisions fits very well into the topic of our conference. Decisions made in recent years made Poland perhaps the only country in Europe which has fully diversified supplies of natural gas to the country. During our conference day today, we're going to have four panels and two introductory speeches to presentations. Of course, we need to stick to the time framework allocated to the panels. The first panel on the Three Seas region, Gulf of Mexico, Middle East, and the potential for transregional cooperation. Let me give the floor to the moderator, Wojciech Kubik, the editor-in-chief for businessaller.pl, to take over, and the following topics will be discussed. Development of cooperation in gas and oil supply, LNG sector and the gas crisis, prospects for joint investment, climate neutrality and the future of the oil and gas industry, cooperation in innovative, innovative transformation of the oil and gas industry. Thank you very much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We will proceed to the panel that's going to focus on LNG. We're going to discuss supplies of LNG from different directions. And before I take my seat, 
uh, we're going to have a presentation by Frederick Smith van Ooyen, Vice President for Origination and Marketing, EMEA, Chenier Energy, who will tell us about the prospects for the supply of LNG in the difficult times. Thank you very much, uh, very much for inviting me here and, uh, and the opportunity to speak um, with yourself. It's good to be back, uh, obviously, in person, uh, in group gatherings. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I look forward, I'll keep this fairly short. There is going to be some panelists that uh, are very high caliber and honored to be with them today. So um, that will have uh, many more interesting things to say as well. Um, Obviously, after two years of pandemic, we're now in a, in a, in a very different situation uh, in the crisis in Ukraine. And in that sense, the horrific events there are deeply tragic. And obviously, we're here, and I'll talk a bit further about that, what LNG can do to help uh, to support, uh, first of all, the Ukrainian people. But I guess we do that, for example, via Poland and via Europe in making sure we get their energy security Help them with their energy. Great. Is that better? Great. Good, 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 good. Um, before doing that, let's see if this works. That works. Uh, a small note uh, from our lawyers, as always. In short, you can read this at your leisure after the, uh, after the event. Uh, in short, it says, whatever I tell you, don't rely on it. It can be complete nonsense. And I think they specifically put it in because they do know how successful the parties are. In, uh, that PGNIG organizes, and yesterday was absolutely fantastic. Normally, we have a slide here that talks about the Chenier projects because we love our projects. I'll talk a bit about that later, I'll keep that short. But in this case, I specifically asked, kind of again, against kind of like our PR kind of direction, and said, can we first just explain how proud we are to be in close cooperation with PGNIG? Um, it's, it's especially with these times, it's the, the small thing that Chenier can do to help Europe and specifically Poland. Uh, obviously, Chenier has always been talking about kind of the importance of energy diversification. But uh, I think certainly I had not expected it would be this relevant as it is today. And we're extremely pleased that uh, the Polish government and I guess PGNIG in that sense has been so well prepared for the tragic events that are unfolding today. Um, and uh, the contribution that we as Chenier can make to that. Um, a few things highlighted here. The first US LNG cargo was delivered by us in 2017. We closed um, a, a large long-term contract with them a year later that will uh, ramp up uh, to, to uh, nearly two BCMA. Uh, and we've delivered 27 cargos to date, specifically to Poland, uh, that were produced by us and delivered either by ourselves or customers. Again, we'll, we'll come back to that in, uh, when we talk a bit further about what LNG can do to help um, European and Polish uh, energy security. Then we come to what is normally kind of our standard slide. Um, and for those of you, Chenier is not a brand name that is in households, but for those of you that don't know Chenier, we're essentially at the core of us. We've got two big liquefaction projects in the United States. We're the first and the largest uh, exporter of LNG from the United States. Uh, these are two projects, Sabine Pass and Corpus Christi. In total, there are now 45 million tons per annum in operation, which is uh, about 60 uh, BCMA. Uh, it's about 10% of global LNG supply. Uh, and we're very advanced uh, with our next expansion, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later. Um, I won't dwell on this, US LNG, has been and uh, has, for since uh, the first contract was signed in 2011 extremely successful because it's abundant low cost gas it's got very very um, uh, low cost infrastructure cost because in the gulf of mexico there's lots of infrastructure everything is there it's it's relatively easy i would say to build a liquefaction plant there and we've got these flexible contracts and especially those flexible contracts are very, very important, especially now. Uh, and that can be seen on the next slide. So, 
this is US LNG to Europe on the left hand side and more specifically to Poland on the right hand side. You can see US LNG ramped up well before the, um, before the invasion when prices were starting to go up in Europe. A lot of um, US LNG and about half of that, um, that dark blue uh, is Chenier's, uh, or represents Chenier's LNG. Um, gets diverted, um, either it was already destined for, for Poland or for Europe, and it uh, now gets diverted to Europe. Um, so what does it mean for Europe? So Chenier has been, is at the moment the single largest supplier of LNG to Europe. It has, uh, in the past quarter, 75% or more than 75% of our cargoes were diverted into Europe. Um, in total, that's about 100, more than 150 cargoes of LNG. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen an LNG ship. They're very big ships. It's a lot of gas. Um, what does it mean specifically for Poland? If we focus on that, um, so the US became Poland's largest supplier of LNG in, in 2022 um, and has supplied nearly half of, uh, of all LNG. Um, very similar in that sense to the graph you see that applies to Europe. Um, of that US LNG, Chenier produced more than half. So Chenier at the moment represents roughly always about half of US LNG import capacity or export capacity. Um, and just to put it into, I asked kind of, so what does that mean kind of to make it more tangible, these amounts? So 2021, we supplied enough LNG to basically um, supply the houses of uh, 1 million Polish people um, with heating. So uh, hopefully that's, that's a helpful contribution to Poland's and, and, and also I think the wider European uh, energy security. Um, so that's what's happening today. It shows that US LNG with its destination is very responsive to markets that need the LNG the most. Um, but obviously we're also looking towards the future and we have a project that's essentially ready to go. We expect to take FID uh, this summer and it's the Corpus Christi uh, Stage 3 expansion, we call it. So in Corpus Christi, we've got three trains at the moment. These are three what we would call conventional trains of 5 million tons each. Uh, we're now going to add seven what we call mid-scale trains to that, that total 10 million tons. It's fully commercialized. We're working on the financing documentation at the moment. Uh, and everything is basically ready to go. We, in fact, we've already, as you can see on the right-hand side, we've already started to do some work and order some long lead items. Um, hopefully, that will be um, online uh, late 2025. That's in short kind of like um, my introduction to Chenier. Um, feel free to ask any questions or we can handle that during the panel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So stay with us because I, I'm sure I'll have some questions for you. Take a seat, please, and I'll ask other panelists to join us for a discussion. Let me just briefly remind the topic of our panel discussion. It will be full in English, maybe some Ponglish in it, uh, so Polish-English mixture, but still we'll discuss in English, so if someone needs translation, you're free to use uh, the devices that are somewhere over there for you, and we will discuss uh, LNG, of course, and one second. So, uh, our panel discussion is about the three seas region and our cooperation in uh, energy sector in LNG. We'll speak about security of supply, but also the quantities that are available on the market, the possible arrangements between different countries, different companies. So I'd like to uh, welcome once again, Mr. Frederick Smith van Oyen from Junior Energy. I would also like to invite Mr. Przemysław Wacławski, who is the vice CEO for financial staff in PGNIG. Nice to have you, sir. Uh, Tom Earl, Vice President of Venture Global LNG Marketing, is also with us in person. That's wonderful to have you. Uh, we have Mr. Darius Szyleński, uh, CEO of Klaipedos Nafta, also here present in person. Wonderful. Jarosław Mudry, uh, Partner, uh, CEO of ERU, uh, uh, Energy Resources of Ukraine. Managing partner, I don't know if he's here or he, is he online. Uh, he's 
coming or he will come or he will not. We'll see about that. And Darius Kryczka, manager from EY Law. Uh, he's responsible especially for European Green Deal. So uh, it is also an important context of our discussion, if not the war in Ukraine, that would be the, the, the main context, I, I believe. So, uh, gentlemen, I would start with some general remarks uh, when it comes to the possibilities we have in this energy crunch that we are having right now. We were discussing it for several hours yesterday, but we need to go deeper into this topic because we need to look for volumes for infrastructure to provide us with uh, LNG, but also different kinds of natural gas, because we need to keep the security of supply. So let's start with Darius Kryczka and some general remarks on the uh, perspectives of diversification on our market. How is it going? FSRUs, LNG terminals, everyone wants that. How are we doing in Europe in general? Yes, thank you, Wojciech, for, uh, for, for your question. Before I start, I would like to thank you to all of the organizers. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be on the, <coughs> at the gas, uh, gas term, uh, conference again. And also, uh, congratulations for the 25th anniversary of, of the conference. I wish you also all the best. Another 25th uh, year, 25 years for, for this conference, and maybe, more, of, of course, more. Uh, and also, as uh, Frederick said, also, also it's great for me to be back here in Międzyzdroje, uh, near to, near, nearby Sienuiście LNG terminal, because uh, almost, al al almost 10 years I spent for the LNG system operator in Poland, in uh, Polskie LNG, then gas system. So it's also great to, to be uh, again here and also near to LNG terminal. So uh, after you have with the office, could you tell us something <laughs> about the FSRU in yeah. Dance Basin? Yeah. What are the prospects? Let's start with that. <laughs> okay, so but I work. You're for free the, to speak right now. Yeah, I work for the FSRU project, as, of course, but uh, I cannot say right now, uh, Wojciech, because the gas system is responsible for this project. So the the more important. So we can also, also only talk about what official we know. So uh, and the official information is that uh, that project will be uh, by 2027 uh, in Gdańsk Bay. Uh, uh, Yesterday we've heard about 2026 even yeah, from that system, so it is official. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the CEO Tomasz Stempin also mentioned that uh, that that uh, also the gas system is looking uh, for the opportunity, also if there was necessary to 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 even speed up more. Uh, in, uh, even 2025 is uh, in the discussion, so we will see. I, I keep my fingers crossed for this project because it's a very important project for for the uh, uh, supply uh, for the um, for, uh, supply so security of supply in this region. Uh, but you asked me about the about the uh, infrastructure in Europe and how the world LNG map is looks like right now. So we see it's a lot of you know rush right now for the LNG uh, globally, uh, especially right now in the last months because of the in, uh, invasion on in Ukraine by, by Russia and how Europe is changing their mind because uh, European terminal because one two years ago. <clears throat> there was not so much discussion about new terminals, of course, in some parts of Europe, like in, in Central Eastern Europe, yes. Uh, uh, some projects were, were con uh, ongoing, like in, the, in Greece, Alexandropolis uh, terminal that was open uh, this, this year. But uh, right now, we, uh, we heard announcement about new projects uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the LNG terminal in Europe, like uh, uh, that was not decided yet, but uh, German, uh, German government also um, explained and also announced that, that, that they're going with the project with the Stade terminal, with the Brunsbüttel and Wilhelmshaven. So that means that you know there will be a, a huge change for for for, for Germany because uh, the biggest country in, in Europe uh, they uh, and they didn't have the terminal yet so that we double even right now more than than one or two or three and also so that also because they would like to switch from the uh, Russian dependency yeah and what's what's the uh, state of play uh, right now about Europe so we have 21 uh, 21 LNG terminals right now in Europe. It's uh, 16 onshore terminals, like Świnoujście, and uh, five LNG terminals F uh, in the FSRU type. 
so including the uh, Quaypedos uh, NAFTA terminal in, in Lithuania. So uh, <coughs> this is some kind of you know changing because there are some new uh, announcements, as I said, German, but also uh, we heard about the terminals in the uh, Finland and Estonia. They also would like to have uh, uh, FSRU uh, terminals, uh, and the new terminals uh, like in the Emshafen in the uh, in the Netherlands. This is also an interesting project because uh, we know. Uh, from the last last uh, days, that uh, gate terminal said that it's the fully booked for the for the, the biggest terminal in Europe, right? Yes. So so right now, and the Netherlands government is is searching for something new, and that will be probably the new new terminal FS route, FS route terminal in the in the Netherlands. We have the announcement about the interesting project in France, Le Havre uh, terminal. So this is interesting because uh, because as we remember in the history of LNG. The one of the first cargo shipping cargo from the, from Algeria to to France was to Le Havre terminal, uh, and right now they have the thinking about to to reopen or restart the LNG terminal in this place. So uh, it's happening a lot. Uh, I will, later on, I would like to also say, say you about why it's happening also on the regulation side because. This is also based on the regulation side, but I think that uh, uh, um, companies looking on the on the new project and the new ter term terminals and situation in Germany that they decide to the faster. Uh, I think this is that will be possible by the end of the year. They will start the LNG terminal by the end of the year. They promise that, so that will be one of the fastest terminal in the you know in the project to to happen. So that's that's really impressive. So too. what about the availability of FSRUs in the market? Because you know th this is limited and we have some race for FSRU capacities, right? So what are the prospects? So so, be, so because this is also uh, this is this also an announcement about uh, w European Union uh, also in the Repower EU a communication at the beginning of March March they said also about that they need right now in the short term new 15 BCM in this year to find something this some kind of volumes like that that'll be not so easy and also by 2030 something like 50 BCM per year more so that's why that's why this all project that I mentioned before it's it's so so important right now to start to open and to um, to commissioning and also, uh, I think that's uh, a project with um, uh, uh, looking for for this cooperation globally. European Union, we we say we have the <coughs> this cooperation between United States and Europe, European Union. This joint statement between uh, John Biden and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, also uh, last last month. So that's also. And this is something that we started already, as, as my colleagues remember, that uh, we organized together in 2018 this uh, LNG B2B conference and meeting in Brussels. And I was starting this discussion between cooperation between US uh, uh, terminals uh, and exporting terminals and uh, European LNG terminals. And right now it's going ahead with this uh, project, as, as Fredrik also mentioned on the, his presentation. So, and um, um, President Biden also after this uh, this conference also m m promised that there will be new deliveries from US. It's 15 billion billion cubic meters as, as well for for the Europe, and for the long distance as well. So this is that means that uh, US is one of the our European uh, partner. Uh, also, they are meeting with the Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Also, they, they, there's the cooperation between Canada and European Union on the same uh, level. And also, I think uh, there will be new terminals uh, this year, like like Mozambique. There will be open new terminal in Mozambique. Also, the Angola uh, and uh, other African countries. So we're looking at that. There will be also a competition between Asia and Europe for the Qatar uh, Qatar uh, LNG. So we'll see and how Qatar we'll knows that because they are making some strict requirements when it comes to the contracts already, right? Yeah. So we are happy to have one or even two contracts in Poland because now it would be really hard to renegotiate it or negotiate new one, right? Exactly. So so this, this competition that will be also uh, um, it's got it's uh, that will be interesting for for watching on that uh, how the competition will look like. So uh, what I also uh, would like to mention that the last year. 15% globally of the of the new LNG new term new new capacity uh, went to China. So I mean that China is also growing, and, and the expectation expectation is that even 50% of the new LNG LNG cargos 
that we will go to to uh, to China. So that means that you know this Europe is uh, has has the reason to to increase the capacity as well and to receive new LNG. But we have to look at China. At Even China in and spite the of the energy crunch that is making the prices in Europe attractive for the suppliers. Even in spite of that fact, yeah. right? Yeah. So, okay, so even this energy crunch is uh, not making everyone going to Europe yet, but they will come and they are coming and they are coming also to Kuipeda because uh, Lithuania is happy to have its FSRU since like 2014. Right, uh, it was a tool of negotiating gas deal with Gazprom. Now there are no delivery deliveries from Gazprom, and Lithuania is perfectly fine. What are the prospects of FSRU? Could you make some expansion of this project? Do you look for other ways to import more LNG? What are the prospects and proofs uh, of cooperation between Poland and Lithuania and in wider uh, perspective of European cooperation. That question obviously goes to Kuipedes Nafta Boss. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, as well, I would like, first of all, to thank you for inviting me. It's the uh, first time for myself uh, participating in Gaster. Really unique format, so I like it. So I think... Did you uh, like it yesterday's uh, evening? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably first uh, such a kind of conference when you have even an open air uh, festival unique, included yeah. in the program. <laughs> but coming back to, to, to our prospects, yeah, you were absolutely right that uh, Lithuania is being very close to our, uh, let's say, Russian neighbor. Uh, much earlier recognized the risks which appears uh, being dependent only, only on Russian supplies and uh, and uh, in 2014, uh, we started operations of our FSRU independence. By the way, symbolic name of the, of the lady, but that's, that's, that was a meaning, actually. And, uh, and yes, and immediately from the first day of, of operations, uh, it gave an effect, uh, uh, incredible effect for the entire market uh, of Baltic states, uh, where finally we were paying a market price and not 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 the most highest price in europe because of uh, of alternatives so now yeah now the situation is is different uh, another uh, one of the main reasons why we uh, get into this project got into this project uh, meaning security of, of supply is very important and uh, from the beginning of this war uh, Lithuania is uh, able not to buy any molecule from Russia, and we're do, doing that quite quite perfectly. Uh, so, talking about the about the opportunities in the future, yes, uh, you know we have some limitations. It's a, it's a infrastructure which has its let's say design and uh, capabilities in terms of regas. Uh, we have experience uh, by operating bigger ones, uh, being the same, let's say, size of the tanks, but for example, in KNSU, uh, Klaipedos Naft operates FSRU, uh, power to, uh, gas to power project, where, let's say, the capacities are, are double, and nevertheless, size of FSRU is the same. And yes, we are really considering now that, uh, you know, suddenly, this uh, FSRU unit, which had some criticism on being too big for such a small too state, like, like yeah, too expensive. Uh, suddenly, we know that from it terms, it's right? like uh, yeah, it's like uh, probably three times as small as it is needed for now. Or while the Europe is balancing the alternatives and uh, balancing uh, or assuring uh, security of supply in the region. Uh, theoretically and technically, uh, of course, it is possibility to expand or extend uh, regasification capacities on this on this unit. Uh, but uh, so far, you know, everything depends on how the uh, events will develop further. And uh, and of course, that uh, that uh, you know, this is related as well on the other projects like Darius properly mentioned. Uh, uh, fin Finnish and Estonian project in, in the same region and meaning, you know, maybe if some competition is appearing. Uh, but from the technical years, perspective, it's only about the SPVs inside the uh, ship, right? You, you need it's, to it's, adjust. It's, it's, a, it's simply saying it's installation of additional regas train on board of, of the ship, yeah, which we are going to acquire. Yeah. So you'll see about Estonia and Finland FSRU, and then you'll decide if you need an exp expansion. Right? Uh, I, I don't think that it's the only one, you know, reason. Uh, it should be some, you know, business case, so to say, uh, behind, and uh, maybe we can draft some partnership. Uh, we actually going for 
for the long-term capacity booking. Uh, uh, and you're looking I think at end, end of July, end of July, yeah. so up to 10 years. So we will see how this process will go on, and uh, maybe we will be able to make some investment decision to to extend it. Because uh, in any case, uh, even now, in average, we are supplying to Polish market. Not we, but. Uh, uh, LNG which comes into our facility or turns into natural gas which goes through the Gipple connection and it's about what 2 million BCMs per day. It's not a significant amount uh, for such a big market as, as, as Poland but, but still it's a very important part of security of supply and uh, you know being alternative. So, so you're looking at uh, PJNIG boss so I do the same and ask Mr. Wacławski about the possibilities of expanding this cooperation between Poland and Lithuania and general picture of LNG supplies uh, non-Russian gas supplies to Poland thanks to PJNIG arrangements including yesterday's uh, preliminary deal. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so we are very happy to be here with our partners because imagine we have Venture Global here, we have Chenier here, we had Sempre yesterday with Clay Pedros Nafta. Everyone is with us today, yesterday during this conference, during this, let's be honest, difficult period in Europe. So, so thank, you, thank you very much for coming, guys, because it's really important for us uh, to see you here. And well, with respect to LNG, with respect to diversification, maybe I'll, just a bit of the history. So uh, PGNIG terminated so-called YAMAL contract um, somewhere at the end of 2019, and uh, the gas from Russia was supposed not to flow to Europe, start uh, to, to Poland, starting from 1st of January 2023. So, as we all know, situation has changed. So, uh, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine started. Then there was this famous decree of Putin, payment in rubles. Uh, we decided not to do so, so uh, we have no, uh, no no more Russian gas coming directly from the eastern border since, let's say, end of end of April. And um, this LNG LNG possibilities that we are having in Poland now are more more than important. So we always knew that diversification is important, but what has happened in the last days, in the last months, proved that we were more than right. So like. Guys, the thing that happened, no one, one, no one really believed that this situation can happen. And what, what's, what's the current stat, status? So first of all, uh, listening to FSRU I, uh, story, I, I, I may only uh, promise that um, PG and IG shall, shall support gas system in this project because we have our competences. We are building our f f fleet of cargos uh, starting from 2020. So. We, I think we understand this business a little bit. So we have ordered all, already eight cargos, eight vessels in the shipyards in Korea. First two of them will come uh, at the beginning of the next year. So we'll start using them in the beginning of next year. So for, uh, for sure we have some competences that we will share this knowledge with gas system. Uh, for clarification, you are buying those ships or you are uh, just leasing them? Uh, the, the thing is that the, 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 the ships are built for us, and, but, but there is another owner like Marin Gas or Knudsen and we are leasing them. So these are long-term contracts. Apart from that, we have leased for short-term contracts, one year, 18 months, three additional vessels uh, during the spring because of the situation. So. So, so that's that's say let's say that this is one leg. So we are building um, ships to be more independent and flexible because we, we understand that there is LNG in the world. The problem is with the inf infrastructure. So infrastructure in, in, in terms of the por ports in in US. So we have to have a place to ship the LNG to Europe from somewhere. Then there is a number of ships. The number of ships is limited. The, the moment that everyone is, is looking into LNG, to have your own ship and to have this flexibility is very important. And then, of course, you have to, to have the final terminal, like we have in Świnoujście, and we, uh, the one like we want to build in FSRU. Now, with, with the deliveries of LNG itself, so we are cooperating with, with Chenier for, for many years, as, as, as during the presentation, the first delivery was in 20, uh, 2019, I, I believe. So this year, uh, three cargos shall come. But we have a, a big contract in place starting from the next year, 1.5 million uh, tons um, coming on the DES, uh, DES in Coterms. 
with respect of our partner uh, Venture Global. So we had the first delivery during this weekend, the delivery that made us proud because it was also the first delivery that uh, came on our own vessel, like chartered vessel. Oh, Apollonia. Our, Apollonia, right. But we have uh, two big contracts coming with, with, with Venture Global. The first one from Calca Pass, it's going to start next year. And from Plugmin, uh, 2025, if I'm right, right? And then, and then we have two other options, or let's say a few other options, but the one is already in place. This is the GIP uh, connection, the Lithuania connection. So the first, uh, our first uh, LNG delivery to, to Kwaipeda took place at the beginning of May. So GIP is open start, uh, starting from May, so we can also, uh, and we will for sure utilize this direction. Uh, and Would you increase the amount of natural gas coming through Lithuania to Poland? Th that, that's the plan. That's the plan because we want to be diversified. So, so like we we have our needs, but to to be secure, we also need to be diversified. So the more the more routes we have, the better. Okay, but it is about the portfolio you have, but you will reroute it through Lithuania if it's there is a need. Yeah, right? of course, but we will be also booking our our slots, so we will discuss discuss with with our parties in Lithuania first of all to have to have possibilities, then and then then of Go. course we will reroute the um, or or book additional cargos. And then uh, two other uh, two other uh, two other routes. Just to mention, uh, first of all, very famous Baltic pipe, because Norwegian. In the moment when there is a lack of Russian gas, of course, natural, apart from L LNG deliveries, natural source of gas is the Norwegian continental shelf, and we are lucky also here because the Baltic pipe sh shall be in uh, in operations somewhere beginning of the fourth quarter of the next of this year. I'm sorry, so uh, we will push for the for the for the deliveries from this direction. I, I'm not sure if all of uh, all of you noted we have increased our uh, production in Norway, uh, not only by the by the latest uh, last year transaction with INEOS, so we bought assets of INEOS on the Norwegian continental shelf, but even with the current assets, uh, now the the companies on the Norwegian co continental shelf are pushing to to really to maximize the production of gas. For two reasons. First of all, economically, the gas is very ex expensive, so it's it's profitable. It's, it's profitable to do so. And for us, second thing is like to have to have a lot more gas, more more own gas. And the last thing, the last route I would like to mention, it's uh, it's uh, there. There will be an interconnector with Slovakia somewhere in October this year. So so that gives additional option for us. So the more options we have, the better. On condition there is a stable supply from Russia, because Slovakia is getting molecules from Russia also. Abs absolutely, but in the future we can we can try to 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 find some routes from from the southern part of the Europe. So, so the the more options you have, the better. Of course. So if you brought up Baltic pipe, I would need to ask some more about the contractation of this. Uh, pipeline because we have big uh, press discussion about the security of contracts of Baltic pipe. How are you doing with uh, that? Of course, I know it's all about secrets, but what can you tell us about it? Uh, uh, of course, uh, the contractation is, is confidential, but uh, but but I can promise to everyone that we are really pushing on that. So we are working very hard. The idea is, of course, to have significant part of the Baltic pipe filled with our own, own gas. So we are also considering other op acquisition options still on the on the shelf. Mm -hmm. But but apart from that, uh, we are of course we are pushing for the new uh, new contracts. Some contracts were already announced last year, like with Orsted. Um, then uh, we are we are in the discussion with a few other partners. Of course, uh, with the current situation, you, you know, everyone is looking for gas in Europe. So it's not that easy, but we are very present on the shelf. So, so our company there, after the PG&IG upstream Norway, after this transaction with INEOS, we went into the first 10 players on the Nor Norwegian continental shelf. So we are a recognizable company. The same PG&IG, our team here, 
we have built uh, competences, we have our Munich office, we have our London office. These guys re are really experienced and, and market knows these people. So that's, that's, and we are really working on the new contracts to fill the pipe. Okay, so we have a promise from Menzies Droje. Let's keep that in mind and let's keep the fingers crossed. Let's move on the other side of the pipe or maybe LNG tanker. Uh, let's speak to our, uh, uh, to companies which are delivering those LNG volumes to Europe. Let's start maybe with Tom uh, from uh, Venture Global LNG. Uh, maybe you could relate somehow to this Asian factor that was mentioned by Mr. Kryczka, uh, how the market changed after the energy crunch started. Is really Asia the primary market for you or something changed when Russia started its behavior? Well, v Venture Global is uh, our first terminal, which PGNRG is part of, that, that we were just talking about, Calcasieu Pass, uh, which started operations this year. Um, the, the customers of that uh, terminal, the long-term customers, were in fact all European. Uh, the second terminal, uh, Placa Means, which uh, PGNRG is also uh, part of, that started construction in August last year. Uh, and so is under, con under construction today. That, that terminal does have uh, long-term off-takers from China, it has uh, uh, the two state companies, Sinopec and, uh, and Sinuk. And so I, I, I would agree that um, there is uh, considerable um, additional demand coming, both on the long-term and, and, and the short-term from Asia, and particularly from China. Um, it's hard to overstate um, the, 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 the transformation in China as they pivot from coal to gas um, due to the, 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 the blue skies policies of the, of the PRC. And, uh, and so as they pivot from coal to gas, they, they, there, is, there is no terminal in China which is not being expanded, if I can say it that way. Um, and on top of the expansion of their existing terminals, there is the new terminals that are being built in China. So they are going to go from around an import capacity of about 60 million tons per year to about 160 uh, by about... Mo almost twice. Yeah, yeah, more than twice. And, than and, twice. And, and they need to find the product from somewhere and, and, uh, for, for, for this. And so, uh, and, and Australia has not really... Uh, there is a new project in Australia called Scarborough, which is coming. But on the whole, the large projects from Australia have been done. There isn't a big, big new supply that can come from Australia. So I, I believe that China will, will, uh, will, will not only come to the US and to companies like us. I mean, uh, Chenier is also providing gas to PetroChina, LNG to PetroChina. Um, they will go to Qatar. Um, that, that, that in my, my, in my it's view. It's closer. It's closer, so you, you, you have some consideration on the transport cost. They will go to Papua New Guinea, uh, and they will find other pockets as, uh, as well. But, um, but no, I, I, so I think Asia is a big consideration. And I can see how if you, uh, you PGNIG will be a partner um, at the two projects um, that we have at Plaquemines. You will be a partner alongside uh, these Chinese companies, and there will be opportunities for cooperation, in fact, between Poland and, and, uh, and the, those Chinese companies, optimizations maybe, and this type of, uh, um, the, the, this type of, of, of cooperation. So um, I think that's probably quite, quite an exciting part of the future. As, uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I would just say that you, it's kind of remarkable sitting here listening to, 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 to my friend from, from PGNIG here, because you make it sound easy in, in a way what you've built on, on LNG and gas. I, I, I honestly, as, a, as, a, as the outsider here, if you like, uh, you, you are the, a country and a company that is the envy of Europe today in, in what it has built. It, it makes it sound easy, but to put in place the full chain of liquefaction contracts, shipping, uh, regasification, all at a time when, frankly speaking, the rest of Europe was asleep and, uh, and not building anything. And so for Poland to have done that, the vision, the determination to have executed that, I, I personally find it truly extraordinary. It's a, it's very, I'm very proud of our company to have played a small, a small part in that. But the expertise, you, you referred to your, your offices, uh, the expertise that has been built to put that ch the, the, those those uh, pieces of the chain in place is no small feat. It's remarkable what's been wh what's been done, um, and more widely in Poland, I would also say that um, one bit that's not very well known 
uh, is that uh, for, for us, uh, our power generation, our generators, are built in, and here I, I probably mispronounce in Raklau. Do I say that correctly? Rotswaf. Raklav, sorry. Yes, yes I, I we, thought we I know. might get that yeah, wrong. Yeah, we know what you but, mean. Uh, <laughs> or El Blag. Or, uh, but, but those turbines, uh, we, we have a 700 megawatt uh, power plant on each of our sites. Those turbines came from, from Poland, and despite the pandemic, they were all delivered on time or even ahead of schedule. And that's truly, remar truly remarkable. The electro engineering that you have here is also, so you, you are a, an engineering uh, contributor as well to our, to our, uh, our project. So we, we are incredibly thankful uh, to Poland for that. And uh, we're very proud of the partnership with PGNG. It's a total coincidence, I think, that we sit here today having just delivered this first cargo on your first chartered vessel. It was obviously not deliberately in, in for gas term, but... Um, but Why? But, well, <laughs> and, and I think we will do more in there. Maybe you will say more about that later in, for, 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 for in the, the remainder of this year. But uh, anyway... I'm, yeah. I'm not sure I was talking entirely about China. Or uh, your question, yeah, you you anyway. move to other thing I, I'd like to ask you about. One, one, one more thing, okay? Because uh, I'll move to other supplies, but uh, let's start with uh, this general uh, address when it comes to the price. Of course, you cannot speak about details, but when it comes to the price arbitrage of LNG from US, we continuously heard from Russia that LNG will never come to Europe at first, then that it will, be, it will be always expensive. Is it expensive in comparison to what we have here in Europe, especially Russian gas, from your perspective? Well, the, 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 key, the key is that um, LNG traditionally, and, and it, LNG has traditionally been priced off oil, off a percentage of oil. So typically the, the old, you know, five, seven, ten years ago, you would pay 14, 15 percent of the barrel, the price of a barrel of Brent. And, and this was because this was, it was designed this way because the pricing was designed this way by the countries like Qatar or um, supply, African suppliers and so on, that, that because there wasn't really any kind of gas index that was reliable and deep enough to price gas on gas, which sounds completely daft, but it, but it's the case. And but then with the with the coming of the U.S. supplies, gas U.S. LNG is truly priced on gas. It's the, the price of the U.S. gas is related to the, the the cost of producing that gas. So it is the LNG is gas priced as gas, and so that's the, 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 the that's that's the big change, uh, the number one big change. And so in a world where you have one hundred dollar Brent uh, or, or this kind of uh, Brent, and you are paying an index of it, then of course it's much nicer to have the gas priced as gas. And, and so that's a big, uh, a major benefit of U.S. gas. The second major benefit, which Poland and PGNIG have, 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 have taken um, advantage of, is, is the fact that the, the U.S. Is, uh, the US uh, LNG is free on board. It's completely flexible so that when PGNIG is coming with its, its ship, it is completely free of where, of where that LNG goes. And that's an important point to say, too because weather fluctuations or demand changes over time when these are such long-term contracts, that flexibility is really important. And that is, so it's not only purely about the price, there is some additional economic benefits from, that Arbitrage. will come from owning that flexibility. Okay, so we know that Junior Contract has the delivery ex ship uh, clause, so it's kind of kind of different. Could you, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, Frederick, uh, could you uh, say something more about the importance of this contract with PJNIG in present circumstances and the possibilities to expand this cooperation even further on, maybe uh, speeding up the process? What are your thoughts ab about it? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't give two more kind of details on the contract, but... Um, you can't, right? But I'm um, trying. But no, we, we are very pleased to be working with, uh, with PGNIG um, on that and to have established that contract and to provide that, uh, that supply security for Poland. Um, in that sense, uh, I would like to completely echo what Tom said earlier about the, the way that PGNIG has established kind of like from uh, a zero start to uh, now I, I would say a major LNG player is, uh, is astonishing, frankly. It's amazing, um, as is their whole uh, way in preparing for the energy security for Poland. Um, I, I think uh, the other day uh, you announced that you were having your storage coming out of winter at more than 80 percent. I mean, <laughs> it's almost 90 that's, that's already. Yeah, almost 90. I mean, that is phenomenal, right? Um, so, so 
excellently done. I think um, uh, in future, you know, we'll we'll see what will happen. We'll, we'll obviously be very, very keen to further establish our relationship with PGNIG. We've always been very kind of clear in what we do. We are primarily a liquefaction company, so we sell most of our volumes are sold FOB. And uh, in relation to the point about Asia versus Europe, indeed, kind of most of our customers are also European. Uh, but again, because they're most of them are FOB, they can take it anywhere they like, um, as some of our Asian customers as well. But PGNIG is this, right? PGNIG is a, is a DES contract, so uh, it's uh, you know destined to be here. Um, now, um, and in the future, we'll be happy to do any type of contract, whatever suits best for PGI and IG. We generally just listen. We have a very strong um, portfolio of um, uh, also in including some desk contracts, but a portfolio of ships, so we have a very good capability, and, uh, and that's now um, uh, to deliver the LNG. And for some customers, that's the right thing, and it depends on the time and the position they're in at that time. Um, so, so it's really up to the customer to decide whether they want to have FOB or deliver tech ship. Do you have extra volumes, or will you have some? So we're soon uh, we'll we'll take um, FID on stage three. That will um, uh, indeed boost our our our, our capacity. So typically. Uh, Schneer is a very kind of in that sense a very boring player. We typically contract as much as possible for as long as possible. We're a bit in that sense like a utility, um, um, and the reason we do that is because it allows us to kind of make the liquefaction cheaper and make it available cheaper. Uh, and it's something that our shareholders also uh, like about our risk profile. We are extremely robust. Um, so um, I'm sure we'll, we'll be definitely be, uh, be looking for more long-term customers, yes. So first the contract, then the final investment decision. Correct, correct. Yeah, so we'll, we'll hear more about the contracts. Then let's move back to Lithuania just for a second, because as I understand, you are importing 100% of natural gas outside of Russia, so it's coming in 100% from US right now? Yeah, you're right. 100 Everything supply. on long term or spot deliveries also? You know, this is a question to our customers, which we have, I think, six of them. It's open access terminal, so, so you know, this question is not for me, but yeah. Yeah, so as we can see, LNG from US is here. It, it wasn't to be here, according to some analysts from Russia, but it is here. We, we, we know that in gas term, we knew that it would happen. So it is happening and it's for the sake of our security, but also for the business uh, opportunities here in Poland and all over the world. Uh, let's move to the other topic, the uh, other side of the coin, because we know the European Green Deal is not going anywhere in times of energy crunch. It could go, uh, it could drop in even uh, harder, even deeper, because uh, one of the ways of uh, decreasing the dependency on Russian gas is to decrease the dependence on gas itself. So uh, we have Repower EU program, we have the European Green Deal, of course. How to handle security of supply in times of uh, climate policy so advanced and uh, advancing even further on? how to save the economic sustainability of such, con uh, such projects in Europe, but also in the US. The first, uh, first mic goes to Dariusz Kryczka. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Wojciech. So um, I think this, uh, um, to clarify uh, all information, what we know right now about the regulation side. So we know the European Green Deal uh, is the project starting 2019, announcement by the European Commission. And that was still going through to the goal. And the goal is to have the, by 2030, the 55% uh, reduction of CO2 regarding 1990 uh, emission. And this is why we call Fit for 55, because it's 55% 50, 50, of reduction. And, uh, and the main goal is to have the carbon neutral uh, continent, uh, as uh, also on the line uh, uh, it's always says so that uh, it's, this is the goal to have this, this, uh, this goal. And uh, this is the packet of legislative uh, proposal and never, never in the history of the European Union, this is interesting, never in the history of the European Union, we, have, um, we never had so many legislation projects 
uh, in this short period of time. Yeah, so this you know you can you can in, you heard about you know all the new directive that's publishing uh, almost every month or every two months by by the European Commission, and then then change the landscape of the uh, of the uh, our our situation and environment here in in Europe. Uh, yeah. We see that Tom is not in, in some disagreement with what he's hearing, right? Yeah. Ah, one mic. No, we, we got more mic mics. Diversification. It's not yeah. A, it's, not, it's not a disagreement. It's more this the, 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 the hearing the the the, the, the this uh, huge amount of European legislation. Obviously, being being British, uh, maybe I'm a, a little uh, <laughs> a little biased about that. But um, but I I think the the there is something a bit strange about the 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 situation in Europe on the 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 green with the gas and and and. Uh, this is even worse in the United Kingdom in the last 24 hours or 48 hours when I see that our Prime Minister suddenly made an announcement saying gas is now green. Yeah. I mean, what is, uh, what, this is the most absurd announcement to, 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 to have the political right to change the colour of something. And, it's a, it's of course and it's now a, it's cool, yeah. And, 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 and actually what's important is that as an industry, we, we uh, uh, speaking for the supply side, and this is what we're trying to help the European... Uh, European Commission recognizes that there are enormous uh, programs underway in the United States that incentivize very, very heavily uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the hydrocarbon sector to, to, to clean up the methane issues that it, of course, has, and also to promote uh, carbon sequestration under the 45Q tax credit scheme and, uh, and so on. And I think we did, uh, there is a bit of a mistake. When, when the United States does this kind of thing, you can be sure when the economic incentives there are there, it will happen faster than anywhere else. And, and so you will have uh, uh, the first CCS uh, carbon sequestration sites on the Gulf Coast. They will be very, very comprehensive. The, the, uh, but somehow we are not... Um, not always able to convince the European Commission that this is this is serious and it's happening, but it is happening. It is happening, and going back to Derek, how to handle this tension between you know security of supply and climate goals? Yeah, yeah well, I would like to also uh, yeah. say what David said already. Um, you know, a few years ago when we on the gas conference, we I I heard the very good ni nice motto that we the, the panelists said that uh, blue is the new green. So, so it's not. <laughs> yeah, that was about that. The, the uh, that uh, natural gas is the transition fuel. We're going through the natural gas to the to the changing the situation, the reduction of emission, and so on and so on. But right now, uh, it's a little bit change. Uh, it's still important, especially on the case of the uh, as we talked before about the security of supply. But uh, because also about the regulation by the preparing by the European Commission and uh, that gas is the transition of is not change but uh, European Commission is looking for for the next steps meaning the hydrogen uh, green gases like biomethane like synthetic synthetic methane like ammonia uh, and so on and, and and right now there's the how how the infrastructure meaning the pipelines but also the LNG terminals are ready to receive this uh, kind of green gases. And what is more, the European Commission prepared the EU foundings with this, uh, with the, this, this disclaimer, this, this uh, uh, you know, it's obligation for the new uh, investment funds for the EU uh, foundings that that uh, if you would like to invest in the new infrastructure of, of uh, natural gas, should be also green gases ready you know, for, for, for the future. So this is something that's, that is the real reality that we have, not only regulation, but also financing, uh, what will happen. Also, uh, most <coughs> there's a lot of uh, um, proposal or maybe announcements like, like European investment banks. You know? A few years ago, they cut all, all the, two years ago, they, they cut all new investment on the natural gas. No, there's only renewables and, and so on. So that means oh, it's great to have the new infrastructure, but also you have to find the financing for that. Yeah? So, so there's no chance for revision of this approach to natural gas if you want to have more LNG from US, even if you want some. Yeah, and this is uh, for now, for, for in the case of the European Investment Bank, no. They, they <coughs> that, was maybe we, if, uh, that was a discussion maybe that would change because of the Repower EU and so on. No, this is not change. Change only for the... Uh, uh, for the investment on the renewables, 
and going through the regulation. So I said about the European Green Deal, Fit for 55 package last year, <coughs> and also what is important for oil and gas sector. As uh, uh, decarbonization package in the um, in December, the, uh, December package, that we have the decarbonization package of uh, hydrogen and natural gas uh, last December, and repower EU right now, the communication from, on, uh, from March, and right now, tomorrow, we have tomorrow the, the official announcement. We have some links right now about uh, what's what happened it's in, in, in the media, about leaks, about what, what, we, what we prepared by the European Union on the Repower EU uh, regulation. And what we know is also that uh, that will be important for invest more on the renewables, uh, to have more uh, increase the targets for the energy efficiency. So that will be also uh, important for European Union and also preparing the hydrogen, like hydrogen accelerator. Uh, we know that uh, you know, there will be more also import of hydrogen in the future. There will be a lot of money for, for hydrogen. Uh, and regarding the LNG, when we're talking about LNG, uh, um, also European Union would like to have this uh, cooperation with the other countries that we said already. So the uh, European Commission would like to uh, convince our, our, our global partners like uh, like uh, Egypt in Israel also to to increase the new volumes to Europe so that's we also European Union will use the diplomacy for that we can say that climate diplomacy but also the gas diplomacy will be uh, uh, involved in this in this uh, repower EU uh, uh, projects yeah so uh, take from Chenier I, I I see that uh, you want to say something about it how how do you see that yeah, so Shanir has a slightly, uh, in, in that sense, in sympathy with some of the comments about, you know, green gas or blue, or what, what the color of the gas is. Shanir has a slightly different approach. We want to specify actually what the gas is, regardless of the color. We just want to say what the gas is. So we started uh, a number of years ago, um, I think through four or so years ago, five years ago, and we put in place a scientific team that has been looking at kind of all the emissions up to the delivery point. Um, and over the past years, they've been working together with our uh, gas suppliers, our midstream, obviously our own liquefaction plants, and also on the shipping side, we have some of the most advanced equipments that's never been used before in any part of that value chain to establish what actually the emissions are. Uh, and as we announced last year, sometime this year, uh, we'll be um, putting what's called cargo emissions tags on every other cargo. So our customers know what's in their cargo, what has been emitted to produce that cargo. Um, and this is all in a super transparent way. Uh, papers are available online, they've been peer reviewed or are being peer reviewed. Um, and this is now in a very advanced stage and it's uh, in that sense a pleasure to kind of give that transparency and say, well, green, whatever the color of the gas, this is actually what your gas really is. Um, and that's then for them, for the customers to use, because they'll all have, might have different regulations and different things they need to adhere to, and hopefully that will help them uh, for this, you know, the decarbonization in the future. Yeah, so if you're looking for decarbonization, Derek, uh, what are the possible options? Because you hear that Americans are fully transparent, they want to show that they are decarbonizing also, they do what they can to save the climate, methane emissions yeah. uh, also, uh, the different sources like Russia with the highest methane emission in yeah. the world is also not the best uh, route, uh, not the best source, looking also from this perspective, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, in many cases that we, uh, mean we as a European Union, we cooperate with the US, uh, like the methane emission. You remember the on the last COP26 uh, in, in, in Glasgow, we have this global uh, methane pledge, yes? So the cooperation, not only US and the European Union, but many countries in the world, to 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 work on this methane emission because you know we, we focus in the in the global discussion on CO2, but in fact the methane emission, methane is more you know uh, uh, dangerous for the for the climate change but for the, shorter term. Yeah, right? <laughs> but you know that means that it's your poison. Yeah, <laughs> so that's that's right. Is uh, that is this cooperation is 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 going uh, together uh, uh, you know uh, together between European Union and US. Uh, and also, European, European Union is doing uh, um, uh, uh, many efforts to, to for this European uh, for the reduction of the methane emission because we have the even European Union together with partners they created something like AMO, meaning the International Methane Emission Observatory. So that means that all regulation that is put on the you know on the Green Deal is important, but the verification will use the technology satellite 
that uh, you know with the part that we're checking this you know reports by company that's not lying in the reports about methane leakage for instance yeah so this is the real business means that uh, like you may like you mentioned that uh, there are some countries in the for instance that was also about russia and you know uh, methane leakage that was uh, uh, publishing uh, officially that some same pipelines that are emitting methane or methane leakage including Yamal pipeline yeah. somewhere in siberia right yeah and that means that will be in the new reg on the new regulation that will be no 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 possible yes yeah? so if the you, you will, uh, companies will pay uh, costs for for the methane emissions yeah and the methane emission that will be you know measuring uh, uh, the MRV yeah so so that was also so important and verification uh, and also reduction of this of this uh, of this methane so that is quite quite important and I think also Frederick also mentioned second so one is the methane emission a second also important topic for the whole uh, uh, sector of the, of the economies but also for oil and gas especially in you know, oil and gas is that we carbon neutral LNG yes yeah? so this is something that uh, Using how how to uh, how to decrease the the emission of of, uh, of LNG on the all of the value chain, yes, yeah? so of upstream, midstream, and downstream, uh, and also uh, the same. So MRV, so how to measure how to, how to how to uh, dec decrease this uh, this uh, uh, emission, but also offsetting. You know, this is the new 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 new. So how to offset this emission and voluntary carbon market. It's also growing right now uh, in the in the in the in the economy globally. After as well, I mentioned about the COP26 in Glasgow. That was also a decision by the governments about the Article 6, and this is the base of the Article 6 for the for the new framework globally. There will be countries, uh, institutions that will create new framework for how to uh, reduce emission and offsetting. So that will be not only, because a few years ago, we were talking about voluntary carbon market, it's voluntary, it's not necessary, not obligation, it's ki kind of PR, somebody said or something like that. Okay, that was in the, in, the, in, the, in the past, but right now we have the base of the regulation, global regulations, meaning that also there will be regulation by the countries, yeah? So for all of the country, for the uh, companies from the oil and gas sector, that will be for the next uh, years, very important to, to prepare for that. So only one question, because of course it sounds really good for the climate especially, but what about the wallets? Can we afford that in times of energy crunch? This is a good question, of, of course, because you know, one is the regulation and how to achieve these goals. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's good that I'm not on site right now to pay that, meaning on the, as, a, as a representative of the company, but also uh, that would be some help from the, from the financing by the by European Union, for instance, but of course not for everything. And that would be, that would be a diffic, diffic, awesome, some kind of difficulties for, for the CEOs, for the boards, for how to, to achieve this goal but uh, you know it's it's, it's uh, important for the for the climate change for the you know uh, uh, for all of the global uh, paternity you can say you know exactly so it's a great ground to ask some CEOs about these uh, opportunities uh, PGNIG was to present its uh, strategy which was also including the renewable gases so how the energy crunch the issues with Russia impact your strategy? How do you assess the possibility of developing those gases in present circumstances? I think that in the current circumstances we need to be practical, so, uh, and that really practical. So first of all, energy security of Poland is the most important thing for us. And uh, with this respect, uh, well, looking at the Repower EU, uh, like being independent from Russian fossil fuels, this is something what we do. So we can like take it as more or less done, at least from the gas side. Uh, going more into renewables, it's absolutely understandable for us. The, the problem is uh, that this is, and being quite honest, this is more on the R&D side still from our perspective. So we are looking at two options, uh, of course, at the, at the hydrogen and, uh, and biomethane. Um, and also we are looking at our com core competences. So, so as, uh, I with this respect, we are looking at the dis especially distribution segment and storages. So um, um, our, our idea is to, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to, to build competences around stor storing hydrogen in Poland because we have storage capacities of, of the gas, uh, of the natural gas. We have these soil caverns that can be also used 
for st uh, storing the the hydrogen and we are working uh, on this project this is but this is more on the let's be honest on the r and d level second thing is that um, we we are working on the uh, injecting additional fuels let's say into the our gas distribution network so we have the project that we have built a artificial network we are uh, we are producing uh, producing gas and the idea is to mix uh, this natural gas with 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 hydrogen and and yeah, uh, check how how the our distribution um, uh, network will uh, will react on that but but being quite honest looking at the transformation in Poland transformation cannot take place without without gas so and that's like mathematically uh, ga gas is cleaner than coal and we will be moving away from coal although math now, from the economical point of view, maybe it's a bit now. Um, uh, some there were periods of time where it was a bit less, less, less expensive to to produce from coal than from gas. But generally, uh, looking at fit, fit for 55, we need to first of all get away from coal. So our pr projections are that the consumption of gas in Poland will will increase okay. in the in the next years. The thing is that at the current prices of gas. It um, like this de demand for a moment will s may stop or even decrease. So natural gas may be a bit too expensive for for some. Uh, I mean business in Poland. So uh, demand for in the short term may decrease, but in the long run, I'm sure that the, uh, the demand for natural gas will increase. And mm -hmm. our main task is is to supply this na natural gas to Poland. And what about your strategy when it is online? Uh, with, with with the renewables uh, general strategy of PJNIG because it was to be published this year do you well, have any date well like uh, we we did, uh, as you probably remember or we haven't published this, the, our strategy because we are still in the process of merging with PK and Orlen so most probably we uh, we will combine our strategies that we didn't want to make a mess on the market with introducing a new strategy just just uh, before the the merger so we we postponed that but but generally the strategy of pg and did not change so the main task is to secure gas deliveries to poland uh, to diversify and of course we are looking at this green side as well because we fully understand that this is the future of europe however I would say more in the l in the long run. Okay, thank you. What's the view from Lithuania about this tension between security of supply and climate policy? Yeah, so well, we are kind of joking in Lithuania uh, about the priorities. Uh, on the first day of war, immediately COVID has ended up and nobody was wearing masks. Yeah? So when we are talking about priorities and then talking about, uh, let's say, our, uh, let's say, brief of a strategy, it almost uh, matches what was said by, by PG&G because we are part of, uh, of value chain of logistics of energy, energy sources so, and uh, doing that more than 60 years actually. So we must adopt first of all uh, and uh, to provide services and be in those chains uh, of those energy of the future energy carriers. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, mm, properly mentioned problem of uh, methane slips and emissions is uh, as well very important for our company. And uh, I think uh, no doubt that uh, gas will be used in that in this region at least for, for decades. But it's very important to do and to handle that gas in a proper way. So trackability, as you said, uh, and second of all, you know, you should control all your processes not to emit at least while regasification process, while transportation process, so we will definitely invest into, into, into monitoring of that and into, into let's say, sustainability, uh, let's say, projects, uh, just to be as, uh, as neutral as possible in this, in this phase. Uh, but uh, talking about additional streams, uh, what we are looking at and investing our resources is still CTS, is a capture and storage of, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, carbon, it's not so popular in Europe, but still we have some partnership with a Japanese uh, company, and uh, we see some potentiality on that. And I believe we can balance. We cannot balance uh, fully without that. Actually, without capturing. Okay, so going back to US, you you've done that in the past after the oil 
oil crisis in 70s, you increased the pace of innovation in your uh, hydrocarbon sector, and now you have the uh, shale revolution that is going all over the world, thanks to the LNG and oil deliveries from US. So how do you uh, guys perceive the possibilities to uh, innovate further on uh, in, of course, climate uh, adjustment of your business, but also when it comes to effectiveness, to decreasing the, uh, the, uh, the amount of money you need to uh, uh, pay to make it happen, to make it even, even cheaper, even more effective. First, maybe Chenier. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Just to kind of also emphasize, I think, the point that was made by, uh, by both um, uh, gentlemen from Poland and Lithuania. So the, 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 there isn't really, I think, a trade-off between climate and energy security. I think to have a successful energy transition, an absolutely essential precondition for that is to have energy security. Because if people are left in the cold, literally, the energy transition will fail. So uh, I think both go very well hand in hand. And what that means for, um, and particularly for gas, is as the cleanest fossil fuel is, a, that is the, uh, the backstop for as long as that takes until there is an alternative, which I agree with, is, 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 is probably for decades. Um, but also it means indeed that, uh, and that's up to the gas industry, we need to do our work to need minimize these emissions and look at reduction opportunities. And that's all, um, again, coming back to another point, that's all a matter of you know, hard science, we have at the moment, we've got all kinds of, we're installing in the suppliers and all the way throughout the chain from the very start to the to end, we have um, land-based monitoring, we've got drones, we've got aeroplanes, we've got satellite monitoring to find out um, most critically indeed methane, uh, methane issues and, um, and, and reduce that. And we're working obviously in close collaboration with our partners because actually uh, liquefaction is a very small part of the emissions profile of the entire value chain. Um, and a lot indeed is obviously at the very end when you burn the gas, uh, but, uh, but most of it is more in the, in the upstream. And that's why we are working very closely with our partners there to kind of get those emissions down. Thank you very much. And Venture Global? Well, I would say for the liquefaction part, um, the innovation there is, the, is, is going to come in the form of, of uh, sequestration, um, so in our case, we, we are uh, implementing a, a CCS uh, facility at Calcasieu Pass, where, where PGNIG is, and, and also at, at Plaquemines. And so that, what that uh, sequestration is doing, it's, it's taking the uh, CO2, which is, coming, uh, which is being stripped out of the gas stream coming into the plant. So it's the, where the gas is treated. So typically, in the, in the gas that's flowing into the sites um, can have anywhere one to two percent of CO2 content, and and this uh, th this uh, we we're stripping out the CO2 from the pretreatment stream, um, so that the pure CO2 stream is then being sequestered at the site. The Gulf Coast just happens through geology to have an ex extremely good geology for doing sequestration. So in terms of innovation and 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 how that is is going. Um, not only has the right financial conditions been put in place in the United States through the tax system to pay for that, so, the, so it's, it's being handled financially through the, uh, the tax in, in the US, um, it, and also the physicality of the, the Gulf Coast is there to support those, um, the, those CCS uh, projects. So that's, uh, that you're going to see uh, more and more CCS projects on the, on the Gulf Coast, not only at our sites, but I think on, on many. Okay, so it's already happening in spite of what's happening uh, in Ukraine right now. We are all watching closely what's happening, but we cannot be sure what will be next. Uh, Poland and Bulgaria were cut off from gas supplies on some pretext reason we won't dwell into because it's nonsense. But uh, <laughs> to go back to the uh, serious discussion, uh, I would ask a general question and uh, those willing could answer. Uh, what if we have a total gas cutoff to Europe this autumn? It is of course possible. Uh, what are the uh, what is the potential of uh, companies in Europe to handle, and what is the potential to increase the pace and volume of uh, supply from US to help? What kind of intervention from EC from the governments on both sides of Atlantic should be uh, in place? Who wants to answer? I see you want to. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I clearly see you want to. No, I, th I think we'll um, uh, obviously. I mean, if there's a total cutoff, um, uh, that's a, a, a lot of gas that isn't just readily available. Um, but I think what we have seen over the past kind of three months, uh, and even before that actually, is very encouraging about the responsiveness of, in particular, US LNG. And again, it comes down to diversions. Uh, all our FOB customers can divert it into Europe if they want to. Uh, and indeed, uh, that has, that's clearly what has happened, that most of them have done that. Um, so that's, I think, very encouraging. Obviously, we'll continue to build as soon as possible more liquefaction capacity. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sometime this summer, we hope to take FID. Um, uh, and Chenier has an excellent track record in delivering things well ahead of schedule. So we hope to do that again. Um, so that will happen. Um, um, and, and in that sense, the, 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 I would say, bulk standard US LNG contract, which is the basis of uh, Chenier's kind of long-term customers, uh, which is very similar in that sense, I guess, to Venture Global, but most US um, uh, exporters, uh, is tremendously adaptive in making sure that Europe uh, can get the supply it needs. Now, it, you know, getting all that volume is, is obviously uh, very hard, but uh, I'm very encouraged to see indeed Polish gas storage is up. I'm very encouraged by the, um, certainly the regas bottleneck being, uh, being reduced um, before this coming winter with indeed uh, in Germany, um, uh, Lithuania, maybe Estonia, um, uh, and in the Netherlands as well. So hopefully all that will definitely help to, uh, to uh, reduce the impact uh, were that to happen. But I have heard that U.S. government might also give you some guarantees that if you invest in new volumes, new capacities, that your investment will not be lost. Some federal security of investment. So, um, so the, the the future. So, liquefaction is not uh, is something that can't be built kind of in a year. It will take. So, um, I think as per as per So. We, we would take FID in, in the coming months, in the summer, um, and that would expect it to be started on by the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. So you need to have at least a, a couple of years before you can benefit from that. So the coming winter, uh, I think, will be tough, if, certainly if that happens. Um, and we'll just need to make sure that we do whatever we can, and, and Chenier certainly uh, does a lot of that. What we have done, for example, very much uh, with all this in mind is, uh, and these are relatively small things that we can do, so it, it doesn't give you whatever 10 BCMA or something like that of that order of magnitude. But we have now, we're very much looking into kind of planning and optimizing our maintenance, for example, to make sure that we can supply as much as possible as we currently can to kind of uh, fill ultimately at the moment European storage and make sure that Europe is ready for winter. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Who wants to answer this tough question, I know. Yeah. It's a tough question, uh, which again, I think also that you can say that question is winter is coming now. So this yeah. is uh, something. Another like, one. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in the, because we have, we, we're talking about, you know, uh, different periods, no? meaning the, the short term, meaning this winter, next winter. Let's speak about the short term. Okay, the short term. So, so in the short term, uh, so we have the uh, idea of the Repower EU. Uh, of the European Union and the 50 new BCM by the end of the 2022. Uh, and uh, I think 35 is, uh, and the market say that it's possible to have. Uh, we will miss something like probably right now 15 BCM uh, by end of 2022. Uh, there will be new new corridors, new pipelines like uh, Baltic Pipe. Uh, we will see the new also investment on the whole Europe. As I said, there will be also new terminals like in Germany by the end of the of the of the year. Um, what is the bottleneck? Uh, it's also about the uh, um, uh, connection between the LNG terminals and uh, countries like uh, we have this bottleneck in the, between Spain and uh, France, for instance, because uh, as we see, 40% of all LNG terminal capacity in Europe is Spain. And uh, we could, we, we cannot uh, use this capacity so so good, so so much because of this bottleneck of the pipelines between France and, and Spain. There will be new investment, but not in the short term. Exactly. Uh, so, if 50 BCM is missing in Europe, what does it mean in face of total cutoff from Russia? So that other things is also the answering. Um, I, I'm talking about what European Commission is preparing. You know? So, so, uh, so new investment, new new proposal, new new uh, uh, cargo. 
course, this cooperation with global partners, we have the promises from, uh, from US government about new 15, 15 BCM by this year, 50 uh, in the, by 20, 2030. Uh, and also the, uh, another answer of the European Commission is also, as I said, energy efficiency, uh, renewables, investment on that. Uh, in the so reduction in consumption, do you expect that we <coughs> will need to reduce consumption obligatorily? I'm not sure yet, but uh, this is possible. Yeah, I don't think this is possible because uh, uh, if there will be your, in your scenario that you said there's no cut off of... Uh, it's of Vladimir Putin's scenario, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately, but uh, I think uh, uh, I think this is, this is important for us to prepare for that. And Polish government for many years preparing for that, meaning that uh, they invest in the new uh, infrastructures and new, new, <coughs> new uh, uh, infrastructure like LNG terminals, like new pipelines and so on. So, and many countries as well, not not only Polish government, uh, but also many countries, especially in the Central Eastern Europe, like Lithuania, like Croatia. We didn't mention yet, but you know the uh, LNG terminal in Kirk, uh, in, Kirk uh, in Croatia is the part of the South uh, so, uh, North uh, South Corridor. Uh, this cooperation. So this is so important to have this this connection uh, with Slovakia, with uh, Hungary, with Croatia. Uh, you know, 3C initiative. No, this is also important. No, to how cooperate and and sending gas for whole Europe. Uh, and it's so so we see right now how how important that, what was their investment. No, uh, yep. for the many years. So uh, autumn, winter, uh, PGNIG. How do you see that? Will we be in need of reducing the consumption of gas? Maybe I will start with saying what we do not to come to the situation. So, um, well, it's. It's easy to say that we have our uh, storages filled in 90%, which we are very proud of. But to understand how it happened, you must know that we started to fill them the day after the war in Ukraine started. So uh, we didn't wait for any decree of Putin or uh, the cutting out of gas, uh, supply of gas to Poland or to, uh, to any other countries. We started filling our storages in, in February, which is very unusual let's say because you know that you you feel the storages from late, i don't know, spring till early early autumn and then uh, you use the gas from the storages during during the winter so that's that's the one thing second thing is that of course um, lng terminal in Świnoujście is our primary infrastructure now to to to, to make a difference and we are working in close cooperation with gas colleagues from the gas system. So gas system, first of all, ma made some expansion of the of the terminal. But second of all, which is very important also, just to understand, they are decreasing the slots for, for the ships to come. So there will be more slots in, in the terminal this year that, that it was usual to allow uh, ships to come, which is very important. Then the third thing, you know, we mentioned, I don't know if you catch that, that normally our long-term contracts with, with Chenier, with Venture Global, they come in place in 2023, but the, she, the deliveries are already coming. So, so as I said, uh, I think we, we will have three deliveries from Chenier. We had the first one with Venture Global, but Tom, I, can, I think I can openly say that it's not the last one. So, so we are still like order, uh, ordering new, new, new deliveries. And of course, uh, Europe will have a problem when there will be no Russian gas. The question is, from my perspective, because my origin is I'm CFO, so whether the demand will not automatically decrease by itself. Because if there will be no Russian gas, probably the price on TTF hub will 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 go skyrocket, and then some some of the like I, I mean business especially they will simply cut cut the demand, and uh, so maybe there will not even be. Necess necessity, I'm talking about Poland, of course, but I, I, I can't say for Europe, because maybe I, we are in, a, a bit in the different situation. But the better. business will not take the gas, so the, it means, for example, for chemical industry that they will not work. Yeah, or, or they will reduce, or they will reduce, or they will start using coal or something else. So uh, so for sure, uh, the, the, there will be no balance between demand and, you know, but, but and supply, but, but then we will see whether there will be a need for some limitation, like you know, governmental limitation or something, or or the market will balance by itself. But yeah, but by but we are doing yeah, but we are doing everything to not to allow the situation in Poland. So and for sure, for the households, it's not a question. So like households are safe. The question is with the rest of the market. Okay, it's an important declaration. Two words from Lithuania, and we need to wrap up yeah, the discussion. 
just to summarize what has been said, said uh, of course, that would be really challenging. But uh, if this is a part of a war, uh, how you should win a war? You should prepare properly. First of all, uh, think about that now. First of all, think that that can happen and have some measures. And there are some measures. And uh, as, as properly said, yes, supply demand, uh, by my opinion as well, will be disbalanced due to the extremely high pricing. But uh, as I, I am as a representative of infrastructure company, you know, we, we for, for example, did a testing of the maximum capacities of our FSRU. And usually FSRU has a redundancy. One train is a redundant one. So in an emergency case, you can switch on all the power. Uh, substitute in some possible places, you know, maybe gas into some other alternative, even in businesses if, if it's for heating. So, I mean, there are ways out. Uh, I mean, this black blackmailing is not acceptable, and uh, uh, there are success stories not only in Lithuania and Poland, I believe. And but let's let's hope that that will not happen. Yeah. yeah so uh, we have a pretty grim uh, final of our discussion, but still. A lot of hope coming from this excellent cooperation between you guys. Uh, great applause for our panelists. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion. We'll continue it on another and another gas term in uh, Międzyzdroje as usual. Thank you guys. And we're moving to uh, other parts of the conversation. Thank you very much. Wojciecha Zajchrowskiego, praktyczne podejście do projektów cyberbezpieczeństwa automatyki przemysłowej. Tu chciałem Państwu podkreślić, że rzeczywiście możemy się cieszyć, że mamy pełne zbiorniki, w przeciwieństwie na przykład do, do Niemiec. Mało tego, te zbiorniki są polskie. W Niemczech Państwo wiecie, że były własnością Gazpromu i na przykład ostatnio podano, że największy zbiornik niemiecki jest napełniony w jednym procencie. Tak, tak, tak już, 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 już może pan. Yes. <laughs>
our control or approval. A mistaken configuration may lead to a situation where devices that have not been updated or upgraded for dozens of years and are fully unprotected receive access to, inter to the Internet. These devices often have default configuration with default uh, usernames and passwords. Such devices are a great target for, for cyber criminals. Lack of uh, network segmentation in industrial networks mean that it is enough for the attacker to uh, take control of one device to compromise the entire network. And to prove that, I decided to search the internet for availability of such equipment in Poland. And my brief search, it took me several moments, has returned about 100 results of such devices in Poland that are reachable from the Internet. What's worse, some of these devices are probably part of critical infrastructure. So systems that are critical to the functioning of the state are available or reachable to anyone from the web from Russia, China, or anywhere else. Uh, sometimes, in most cases, they need username and password, but bearing in mind that they have not been updated for many, many years, they have a lot of uh, security vulnerabilities. So the attacker doesn't have to know the username nor the password to take control of such a device. What, what a cyber criminal can do when they take control of the device, they can do whatever they want. They can just make a joke and switch the device off, but they may try to get access to the entire network, to compromise it or to encrypt the data in order to request ransom. And another option is trying to destroy the entire system. And we have been observing increasing numbers of attacks over the last two or three months aimed at destruction and wreaking havoc and panic. So we know that uh, an effective approach to cybersecurity requires more attention and more resources. And as a company dealing with cybersecurity for many years, we are fully aware of that. That is why we believe that such projects should not be made complex. That's for that's why we develop a process consisting of three simple steps, allowing for an effective approach to such a project and um, easy uh, starting uh, of such a project. So we collect, we start the process with collecting business information, so we need to establish the requirements for such a system. These uh, expectations or requirements may be different. Um, depending on the organization, from just inventory, stock-taking of the entire organization, to protecting or reducing, preventing attacks. The second step is collecting functional requirements, so what the system should be doing, which features are the most important ones, and which functionalities can be skipped. A very important step here in this stage is the discussion, is a discussion with the automation department and taking them on board the project. Based on our experiences, uh, I dare say that without involving automation engineers, the project will not succeed. Or we may, may implement the system, but no one will use it, so we'll, it will be useless. On top of that, automation engineers are the only ones who have uh, information required for the technical documentation. Another step that we propose is the so-called proof of value. These are synthetic tests carried out in a laboratory environment, and the only requirement to carry out such tests is to copy part of the traffic from a segment of an industrial network and uploading it to some business and functional systems. So, in that way, we can check and test several systems in a very short time and uh, with very limited effort. And the result of proof of value is the selection of one or maximum of two systems that will go to the final stage of our process.
proof of concept. That is proof of concept. Proof of concept, proof of concept include tests in production environment or an environment that is similar to the production environment. So the system that was proven to be the best in the previous step is implemented in the industrial network and in cooperation with automation engineers, we assess how it operates, how it detects devices and industrial protocols. And there are no two identical industrial networks, even in the same sector. They are often proprietary. Uh, there are proprietary devices. In Poland, we have our own protocols that are not being used elsewhere. So a system that is aimed at protecting our networks has to detect and decode these things, these protocols and this information. A very important part of the proof of concept is to establish the success criteria. Success criteria are our requirements which, if met, we may believe that proof of concept was successful. Without listing such targets, such objectives, it may turn out that after running the tests, we are unable to say whether they have met our expectations, whether our system will work in our network, whether we want to implement it, and whether we want to proceed with the project. So it is extremely important indeed to prepare success criteria beforehand. A natural stage after completing the proof of concept is um, taking, moving to the implementation stage. But we are aware that very few clients can go through these steps without third-party assistance. This is due to a shortage of uh, staff and competence, because even best engineers lack experience with this type of project. We have a completely different situation in our case. We are a company running dozens of such projects. We are a company with more than 30 references from all over Europe. And on top of that, as a partner, we cooperate with best OT, security, net, OT network security uh, providers, so we are not focused on one solution only, we always choose the solutions that are best for our clients. So selecting a reliable partner before the project means saving time and money and also guarantees that the selected system will be best suited to your network. Finally, let me add two things. First of all, hope is not a strategy. We shouldn't hope for never being attacked and dream about this not going to happen, because statistics show that everyone will be attacked ultimately. So we have to be ready for that to protect our industrial networks. So that is why I would like to encourage you to contact us to talk about uh, details and about solutions suited to your industrial networks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sticking to the time framework. And now Piotr Banaszewski will tell us about uh, his topic. Piotr Banaszewski, software sales executive of Microfocus. Glad to meet you. My name is Piotr Banaszewski, Microfocus. I'd like to concentrate on several examples. I'd like to tell you briefly about the company and tell you about the cases of our customers. Briefly about Microfocus, we are a global company, we are present in 100 countries of the world and we employ 12,000 people, we, are, we reach 40,000 people. I'm sure you are familiar with uh, one of the brands, Serena, and others listed in the slide, and Microfocus took over these brands. We've been on the market for more than 40 years. We have a more than 300 product lines in six groups and four main transformation areas, supply of applications, simplification of IT transformation, strengthening of cybersecurity, and big data analytics. What's very important, we've been trying and offering this to our clients, not to get rid of their resources, cyber or digital resources, but to integrate 
innovative solutions. There are four main areas of transformation. Still several years ago during energy conferences when I mentioned that our world is the world of applications, very few people believed. Everyone thought that apps are used by banks and financial institutions. These are the locations where applications are actually used. This has changed. Every organization is either a software house, they produce their software, or orders the development of applications while reaching internal or external customers. And every organization uses software, and this is where micro-focus comes into play. We provide secure delivery of software, maintenance of software, its security, and we analyze data collected by every large organization. Our global clients, we operate all over the world, 40,000 more than 40,000 clients from different areas, including oil and gas, just as the slide mentions. Four out of five largest oil and gas companies are our clients. If you use Uber, so, so Uber, their application uses our solution. If you drive BMW, in an individual car, there are several millions of lines of uh, the code tested with our applications. We are also present in terms of identity management and automation of uh, processes in general, motors. A very interesting case study is the company from the oil and gas industry. I'm not uh, authorized to mention the brand of the company. The company wanted to reduce their team and they believe that it would be best suited to meet growing challenges in their business to automize their environment. And they reached the level of 97% of uh, security and other events that are serviced automatically. They, their systems can remediate certain events themselves. Another interesting case is Rabobank, a company which developed a very elaborate an automation environment maintained by a limited group of engineers. It's a global bank present in various locations in the world, and this institution had to focus on automation. Automation of events. Another client, perhaps the largest European airport in Istanbul. A very specific client having various organizations in their location. There are governmental institutions, public institutions, commercial institutions renting space and IT solutions and the airport provides such environments for them and is required to have a health check held there. Theoretically, a single airport but a lot of challenges. Accenture, a well-known IT company, one of the leaders on the IT market. It's a company servicing large volumes of uh, clients and every delay in servicing events, monitoring of applications delivered and managed by Accenture results 
in significant penalties and the company is obligated to maintain SSL and historically they had a number of solutions to monitor their environment and by harmonizing the solution they improved the accessibility of their applications by 30 percent. So we improved the quality of software, some examples in the slide, and software testing. Everyone who follows the area of testing applications can notice that there is a significant demand for testers and we facilitate this activity. We all use our mobile phones and various applications provided by our partners and you need to test every application you need to deliver in terms of its capacity and something that is crucial today. Agility it's crucial in terms of the production and testing of software. The title of my presentation is High Tech Low Drama. Why? First of all, during the transformation period, and every organization goes through the transformation, it's an ongoing process and you need to be able to use resources available and at the same time you need to be able to combine or integrate innovative solutions forced by the market and competitors. And you need to create a bridge between what's new and what has been used so far. And you need to do it in a way to limit dramas related to the inaccessibility of applications for your internal and external clients. And of course, on top of that, the adjustment to digital transformation, to various challenges and new developments, such including tragic developments as the war in Ukraine and the ability to react. The IT uh, budget and security budget can be quite spacious, but whenever we cut budgets, you need to be able to do it at a low cost without compromising cyber security or at a relevant level of risk. I will stay with you until tomorrow. I will be happy to discuss things with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. To summarize the two presentations, please notice that the war takes place not only on Earth but also in cyberspace and notice how IT is important. Let us proceed to the next point of our agenda, Panel 6. Is the gas fuel distribution network the road to Poland's energy independence? A panel organized by the uh, Polska Spółka Gazownictwa. The moderator is Janusz Pietruszyński, editor in chief of CIREF. Thank you very much for this announcement. I'm very glad to see the readers of CIRA.pl. During the first day of this year's gas term, uh, we had uh, this, the repeated mention of this economic reset with the date of the 24th of February, the date of Russian invasion on Ukraine. But we cannot 
branżą gazową. Uh, avoid seeing a certain challenge, a certain phenomenon uh, that the industry and uh, the leadership of the gas industry is facing. Also those who are watching us online. And it is also the role of the media that I represent. This challenge is a disoriented, confused customer. A customer who, after the 24th of February, has entered a state of information chaos that can only be compared with uh, March 2020 and first COVID lockdowns. So this disoriented or confused client doesn't receive responses to all their questions. And these questions have to be answered because the replies, the responses that we've heard during the panels um, and the deepened analysis, we need to add the remaining part of the response. So we need to tell our clients, our off-takers, we need to tell them in a transparent manner what's going to happen in the future. This is the responsibility, the new responsibility of industry players, industry stakeholders to explain to our customers what is what th they should expect. And we, if we do not do our homework here, if we do not process this, we will um, make our disoriented and confused customers vulnerable to information war and hybrid war, which is part of the war that is going on. Because we receive a lot of information that is not fact-checked, that's not verified, introducing chaos in the understanding of the current situation. So in this discussion today, I would like to highlight stabilizing statements or contents, showing us where we are with regard to this process of transition, of transformation, and the directions of the transformation, of the transition in the gas industry. And, and the, the words that have been said here are so important in this respect, how, it tra how the developments translate to private relationships. Attendance is uh, one part of, of the, the event because we are also being listened to by mark market stakeholders, by market players who continue these discussions in their own companies. Uh, and they quote the statements from leaders who take the floor during the conference. So let me point out yet another aspect of this conference. A large number of market players have stiffened their communications policy after the 24th of February. Many companies decided not to take any position, not to issue any statements with regard to the new situation in the East. But the new challenge for the gas industry is that we have to provide our customers customers with information, we have to clarify, and we cannot escape this important part of our activity, apart from investment projects and tasks, apart from implementing our this year's strategy, and we want to have all our uh, performance indicators in green, but we also have to be very responsible with regard to information and communication. And I leave it as food for thought for you. It is not our obligation, it is our industry's decency. We need to be aware of the fact that people out there need full clarification from A to Z of what is happening and of what is going to happen, what's coming next. So let me invite Mr. Piotr Dadjo, Secretary of State, the representative of uh, Public Governmental Administration, welcome. Another participant of our discussion will be Mr. Robert Wienkowski, the President of the Board of PSG, the Polish Gas Company. Good morning. Well, I haven't received any confidential information from the representative of the government. Mr. Artur Michalski, Vice President of the Board of the National Environmental Protection Fund. And our final panelist is the representative of the heating industry, Mr. Jacek Szymczak, President of the Board of the Polish Heating Chamber of Commerce.
Państwa zapraszam Welcome. na to spotkanie. Pełen nadziei, że And będziemy I'm full of hope zrealizować ten that together we are going cel, to try to achieve this goal that I have outlined at the outset. So let's start with a question to the representative of the government administration. Minister, we are in the process of building our energy security and this message has been present in the public domain for weeks, but how many question marks remain? Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, it's hard to answer this question because these question marks will continue to appear during the transformation that we have, are going through. And we are aware of that. We can answer most of the questions that we have defined today as those issues that are important for energy security. And an example of such a question mark maybe how much it will cost us, how much will this transition cost us, and how long it will take for us to achieve a recommended success, so to say. So why am I saying that there's a lot of question marks? Getting ready to the energy transition that we are going through right now, we started these preparations many years ago, and the key point Part of this energy transition was Poland's energy policy clearly defining how we will go through this transition. And now, in a situation where we were all we all agreed that it was a good direction, the direction taking into account all energy sources at our disposal, we suddenly have a situation related to the war in Ukraine. So this war has given us additional challenges that we must and want to face. But a very important component here is that while implementing the policy that we have adopted, war that appeared in Ukraine, Russia's military invasion on Ukraine, has not stopped or halted the current projects, and it has not halted our access to, uh, to gas fuel, to natural gas. So the adequate implementation of the energy and uh, fuel and raw material policy meant that we were and we are ready to change the directions of supplies of gas. We are ready for that. As you can see, there is no distortion Oh, there is no disturbance in natural gas access, despite ourselves being cut off from Russian sources, that has been done by Gazprom. At the same time, we have supplies of gas from other directions, so we are ready. We are prepared for the situation. So coming back to the question, how many question marks will still appear when implementing or when facing the challenges related to the energy policy? It is hard for me to say, but they will appear, for sure. And there will be certainly technical, technology-related challenges. For example, when we are talking about introducing hydrogen or biogas or biomethane to our system, we will have more and more questions. Some of these questions can be answered already today, but some questions will pose technology-related challenges. For example, how much we can add or how much new gases we can transmit through our network. We are talking uh, about these decarbonized gases. So these questions will certainly appear, and we will also have to consider whether infrastructure should be further developed, uh, which directions to take with infrastructure development, and when and where and what kind of new infrastructure should appear. So these questions are hard to define today. However, we have a number of ideas and concepts that should be evaluated from the point of view of usability 
from the point of view of the needs and from the point of view of the market. We are building the infrastructure for the market and we are building the entire transmission system for the market, transmission and distribution system. So that was a general answer to your question. Thank you. Well, Minister, since you have mentioned new ideas, let's establish some minimum foundations for the concept of energy security. What new elements could be added to this concept, to this definition in uh, recent weeks? We certainly need to consider strengthening our eastern area with regard to infrastructure development. Perhaps this eastern direction, Ukraine, will need natural gas supplies from the west, from us. So this is the first fundamental issue. The second area that will result from the needs of the market is the need to consider whether a single FSRU will be sufficient for us. Will it be sufficient for us to ensure Poland's energy security, security of, of gas supplies, not only for Poland, but also for our neighbors who do not have access to a system like ours, so a system of maritime supplies. So perhaps a second FSRU would be a component that would further improve our capacity, our transmission capacities. We certainly need to finish our projects that have already been started, the interconnect, like the interconnector with Slovakia. It is very important also from the Slovakian point of view, because they keep asking us whether we could send gas to them. So these are the things that will have to be considered in, in, within a short period of time, and we will need to take action on that. Thank you very much. And now over to Mr. Robert Bianskowski. And I would like to ask about the period after the 24th of February and your uh, investment timelines for this year. Will they be revised? Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me assure you that all our projects are being implemented and developed on time. But the main threat caused by the war is the increase in energy prices and, as a result, the increase in um, prices of materials. For example, a 100% increase in uh, the price of steel. It doubles the price of our project. It uh, poses a risk of losing certain contractors because without renegotiating certain contracts, uh, construction contracts, they do not want to um, work on these contracts. It's easier for them to pay uh, damages to pay penalties uh, rather than uh, complete their projects. So we would like to have some support from the administration in that respect. We are an important company for the energy transition. We are the largest distribution, gas distribution network operator in Europe. Without PSG, without the Polish gas company, there will be no transition period for the energy transformation in Poland. So we accept full support, expect full support here, and we are not uh, waiting uh, or delaying our actions. We are trying. We have tried to receive the status of a natural monopoly. Well, I'm, uh, it's one of the long COVID symptoms. I'm sorry about that. So it allows us uh, to receive support from the public administration because the enormous scale of investments that will be required by the energy transition without earmarked funds from the EU or from the Polish administration will not be possible. But let me assure you that all our projects are being implemented on time. We returned to connecting individual customers with the on the beginning of the year. We I would like to say that uh, the rumors are not correct, that we are not connecting them, so we'd like to encourage everyone to get connected to our grid and to use our professional services. 
Thank you. Next question goes to the representative of the heating sector. So, several days ago, we had a meeting in Zakopane, a meeting of that industry, and I learned a new word, Polish heating must renewabilize itself in the coming years. I think it was your statement, and what does it mean? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this Gasterm conference. And it is important for a representative of uh, district heating to, to attend a gas conference, because we take part in the process uh, that we can call sector coupling. And this is unavoidable, and this sector coupling has to continue, has to develop due to this emergency situation. Why is that? We have very well developed district heating sector. We are in first or second place in the European Union, and we are already using gas. Our uh, licensed companies use gas at the level of uh, over 10%. This is the ERO data. And we are, if we are talking about the development potential of our sector, by 2030 it is realistic to double that share to at least 20% perhaps even more. So, already today, we generate 17% of electricity in cogeneration in a stable manner, which is very important and very valuable for the power grid. So, if we are able to increase the share of cogeneration units that will be mainly built on gas and renewable energy sources, certainly not coal, we are able to double the share of electricity so our cogeneration units will generate uh, one third of power required by the um, electricity sector in a stable manner. And we also have a, have a very complex situation. We, our sector is also ongoing a certain transformation. There is a lot of plans and there are many ongoing projects. Mr. Michalski can confirm that. However, we are facing an extraordinary situation. Let me use some figures here. It is a matter of very dynamic increase in fuel prices. Since the beginning of 2021, until t uh, April this year, gas, gas price has increased by 415%. Coal has increased, coal price has increased by 350%. CO2 emissions allowance is 162%. So we are in a situation today where we have to think in parallel or simultaneously on two levels. First of all, we have to continue our projects in order to make district heating greener, to increase the share of cogeneration, to phase coal out. We have 69% of coal and only 10% of renewables, and we need to use gas as a transition fuel with the potential that we have. If our installed capacity is 55,000 megawatts and uh, used capacity is 38,000 uh, megawatts, we will not shift from coal to renewables without gas. It's not possible. So coming back to the main topic, we need to simultaneously work on two levels. So continuing our projects, which is very difficult because not only fuels, not only energy carriers, but also materials and services. We have problems with completing our projects. We are asking the CEO of the National Environmental Fund where, uh, about what to do uh, when investments, investment projects projects are funded from public funds and uh, they cannot be completed with the current increase in prices. And the second level is surviving the next 12 months, at least 12 months. Because with the current increase of prices of uh, emissions allowances and energy carriers, we will have to face uh, the increases in heating prices by tens of percent, hundred, more than 100% or more than 200% in case of local district heating. 
So we are talking about that with the ministries, with the Energy Regulatory Office, because then there is a question of how to transfer such energy cost increases, how to translate them into tariffs. So we've made the decision that in June this year, all the companies uh, gathered by uh, gathered in the um, Chamber of Commerce will receive a professional communication guidebook or manual for our clients and uh, individual households to speak with one voice, to explain that we are in an emergency situation. It's not our fault that heating prices will increase so dramatically. We have to survive this period in order to be able to complete and develop our investment projects to become independent and to ensure energy security. We are redefining the concept of energy security on several levels, on, an, on the EU level, on the national level, and on the local level of individual towns and cities. So without understanding from our customers, from our off-takers, it will be very difficult. And that is why we have this special period of time with several independent events and reasons overlapping, influencing the operation of our sector in such a dramatic manner. Deputy President Michalski uh, probably calculates this in his mind. Well, EU, uh, national, local, uh, and individual households should uh, uh, resort to different programs. Uh, sometimes we may become self-sustaining. Uh, and let me refer to one more thing, to what Mr. Szymczak has said. For certain, we're not... Uh, you said that for certain we're not going to use coal. I wouldn't be that certain during the last Gasterm conference in this uh, panel, we discussed that regarding subsidies and when I ask whether we would have sufficient volumes of coal, of gas, uh, the answer was yes, absolutely. Now, this is a cause for concern. No, we should rather have sufficient volumes of gas, but we are not that certain as we were last year. So, for me, I will come back to also convinced, just as Mr. Gienskowski has said, uh, I will be happy because of the declaration that the, all the investment projects will be implemented, because some of the projects in progress where we connect gas are a big question mark, and there there are several dozens of contracts signed, and we cannot just shift EU funding uh, overnight. We have this freedom regarding domestic funding, but we need to stick to specific rules regarding EU funding. So one of the most important pronouncements of Gasterm will be that investment implemented by the uh, Polish gas company uh, are not at risk. And there is also a dozen or so projects in the pipeline. And applicants still don't know whether gas is the best solution, or perhaps they should come up with something different. There are companies that already have gas connected and possibility of using gas stay with coal. They still have uh, contracts uh, to prevent price hikes. So let me come back to financing. In the first priority axis, we have uh, substantial funding uh, earmarked for cogeneration 
and a lot of funding uh, in our national programs, perhaps even more than EU funding. And there are already contracts signed or the contracting is in progress. And the price of gas, which is probably the most important. So various projects uh, all over the country in various towns, and we prepared to implement the cluster program and uh, the preparation of cluster programs, those local energy islands that will be self-sustaining and they will not manage without a stable source as gas or biogas, including methane, unless uh, the district heating will use geothermal sources, which, in my opinion, is the best source of energy. So, Mr. Szymczak will be able to respond that, but uh, let me give the floor uh, to you, President. Have you, did you have to uh, revise your schedules, Mr. Michalski? We develop further programs, so we had to revise our schedules and plans upward. The national program uh, will start very soon and the National Modernization Fund and the Energy Transformation, Just Transformation Fund and, of course, Phoenix. So we have several sources of funding, several programs that are already available or will be soon available, available and and this will help developing gas, not necessarily the gas network, but the use of gas for certain. So 50 billion in the Phoenix program, in the new EU programming period, and the Modernization Fund, and the Just Transformation Fund, another 100 billion Polish Lotus for the transformation of the energy sector. This includes renewables and others, and also gas. Thank you. You started talking about uh, money and uh, you cost a stir among members of the audience. The discussion is much welcomed. Uh, district heating people are very uh, satisfied with your declaration that investment is in progress. Well, what exactly have we said? Investment in progress uh, those investment projects are progressing, but the district heating transformation that the previous speaker referred to, according to what we calculated, we need 50 to 60 billion zlotys to connect professional users. And definitely we won't be able to cover that from our tariff, so there will be the ball is on your side of uh, the pitch. We expect the funding to be available in the National Environmental Protection Fund. Please uh, do not leave for Warsaw. Stay with us. There is something we'd like to discuss with you. I'd like to refer to coal. We're not going to develop new cogeneration sources using coal, but we have a peculiar situation at the moment because when there is a possibility of using subsidies and gas, cogeneration sources are turned off because we have the dramatic increase in gas prices and this unfavorable relation of electricity to gas prices and the tariff regulation which became effective limits the possibility for us to increase prices, especially for units specified before 
moce zainstalowane, November We can increase the price by 3 to 5 percent in power and heating plants, whereas the increase should be at the level of 50 to 60 percent, and this is tremendously dangerous. You've said that there will not be increases for certain, and now you use the word rather. Well, a lot depends on circumstances. We're talking about the directional solution or the systemic solution or what should actually happen when discussing the development of the district heating. 70% of the production of heat and electricity is based on coal, and when 10 million tons is not exported, is not imported, and 60% were imported by trains, now we need to find a solution to subsidize coal, to load coal on ships and to take care of all this logistics and the distribution of coal imported to our country. And this is related to the district heating security and sector coupling is particularly important. We need to cooperate with the electricity sector and gas sectors. I understand your concern regarding the development on the gas market, and this may continue for 12 months or maybe shorter. And while estimating our investment, we cannot follow the same parameters as the district heating sector, that it's profitable for them to use coal. We need to think long term because after 2030, you will be obliged to uh, reduce emission and we won't be able to connect everyone during just one year. A time for a firm declaration. Everyone's waiting. Well, now I just face consequences of my actions. Perhaps I won't return to Warsaw that you need to earmark additional funding. It's not that bad in terms of funding that the modernization fund is a fund uh, from is, few, is fed by uh, the trading in emission rights, and we should be glad because we have larger proceeds and we can increase the volume of funding available through our programs. For instance, the program for alternative fuels, uh, where we have uh, ecological incineration plans, we increase the funding by 2 billion, and we triple the funding available for that because the emission rights are very expensive and we create new and new programs. Unfortunately, these need to be approved by Brussels. EIB in particular, of course, this involves the EU administration and procedures and actually Brussels will decide. And we cannot allocate funding as we wish for the development of the gas network, especially that we would like to make it greener and to make gas greener as such. And fortunately, the National Environmental Protection Fund uh, is with us for more than 30 years, and the Environmental Protection Bank enable us to resort to our domestic funding. We don't need to ask Brussels about that. There are major restrictions regarding the use of EU funding, but we do have domestic funding available as well. Uh, Director Zions uh, left our company and went to the National Environmental Protection Fund. We Now you know everything about us. 
muszę przed wycisnąć właśnie. Znaczy to nie może you can sort of squeeze us. Jeszcze, to, to faktycznie, to deklarację mogę złożyć. Of course, I can declare that at the moment there is sufficient funding for the most important projects. Of course, there is certain framework that we won't be able to extend beyond. We won't be able to implement the impossible, like the development of the gas network, though we can use the domestic funding available for that. So I cannot say for certain that there will be no such possibility. This is something that is related to our energy security and for the national fund, uh, as a national fund, we should focus on reducing emission, and if it's possible, we should do it, even though we use uh, fossil fuel. A question to Mr. Wienckowski. 2030, higher use of decarbonized gases and the cost of the process. What is the cost uh, of the processes? considering the volatile situation. Is it possible to calculate it? Just as I've mentioned, we thoroughly examined the problem and the total cost of connecting users will be 50 to 60 billion. We suggested certain solutions for the Polish government and we requested changes in the energy law. So the cost of connection is borne by the user, the off-taker. We won't be able to cover all the investment projects and only seven years are left till the deadline and the investment required is huge. We are not able to uh, cover the entire cost. Ideally, uh, heat and power plants or boiler plants should cover the cost of building and expanding the connection and its modernization. And we take over the maintenance and distribution. Mr. Minister, the governmental point of view. The revision of the Polish energy policy has already been announced. What is the new role that you would like gas to play in this revised policy? Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a revolution. This is how I must put it while discussing the revision of the energy policy until 2040. The revision involved adding a new pillar, namely energy security. Energy security is defined very clearly, it is dictated by our current situation, the possibility of the total cutoff of natural gas delivered by Russia, by Gazprom. And we need to ensure energy security for Poland by developing our infrastructure wherever it's necessary, because the infrastructure will be decisive regarding our energy security. But it's not only about infrastructure and its development. Our energy policy takes into account other sources of energy that we should develop and include uh, to a larger extent in our energy policy. We know that there is a rapid development of renewable energy sources, and we st still have an upturn there, considering the installed capacity in uh, photovoltaics, we can see that the a tremendous growth in that sector. But we need to uh, take into account geothermal sources, and definitely we are going to support its development, and at the same time we are going to optimize the use of all sources 
from Earth. Standing waters, uh, ground waters, flowing waters, um, Earth heat up to 100 uh, meters and the use of heat pumps. But at the same time, we'd like to develop large heat pump capacity that can be used in district heating. This is something that we need to examine more thoroughly, need to develop more friendly attitude and approach to that, because we won't be able to reach that or use that heat in all district heating plants. We need to also provide heating security to our users. We are aware that we won't be able to reach everyone with gas and gas networks, so if we want heat, district heating to shift from coal to gas, then we will promote solutions that will use renewables to a larger extent. Of course, there will be biogas and biomethane plants and local energy sources. This is important. So we need to look at development of district heating systems working in island mode based on local energy sources, renewables to a large extent, and the coal that will still remain a large share of fuel used in these district heating plants. However, we need to look at the transformation of the district, he district heating industry towards renewables, more towards renewables. Please also note that the projects that were mentioned earlier are expensive. They are physically expensive to be implemented and to uh, have a gas source. So we need to balance the costs, even if it is up to the investor to cover the costs of gas connection, gas net network connection, perhaps it will be cheaper to look at another energy source, like geothermal, and we will recommend, whether it were feasible, of course, so we will recommend this type of solutions. With regard to the revision of Poland's energy policy, we have this external energy diplomacy that our country is currently carrying out. What's on the agenda? There's a lot of information about that. Can we put some order? Can we structure it somehow? What's on the agenda? An important element uh, that the market could be interested in is the discussion about joint purchasing or joint sourcing of, L of LNG. And we think that this idea is very good, but we need to look at specific solutions and uh, specific proposals and what they will look like. So just to indicate that such discussions are being held, I wouldn't like to indicate any specific direction or evaluate the regulations that I hope will be introduced. It is an interesting solution for all of us. Not only Poland's, but Europe's energy security. We are able to ensure our own energy security, but colloquially speaking, our neighbors might not be as fortunate as ourselves. So if we ensure energy, our own energy security, then our neighbors, like Slovakia, will also expect some kind of support here. That's the way I understand it. Indeed, the partner, the main partner of this discussion is the Polish gas company, PSG. So there will be some backstage discussions uh, after this panel. So perhaps let's raise this question here publicly. If subcontractors are entering the contract annexation stage, and there are problems with financing. How does it work uh, from the business point of view? It is a good question. We are trying to 
bring to introduce some changes to the energy law for the off-taker to bear the cost of getting connected to the gas network. Because with the current increase in prices of raw materials, it is not profitable to us anymore. However, it, uh, it is sorted out for us by the ERO. Uh, the, the ERO allows us to recover those costs uh, within a period of up to 17 years. Uh, after 2050, there is no gas supposed to be used. But when diagnosing this problem, let me say that only as much as 25% of grid co network connection costs are borne by the user. If you have a 3.6 tariff and 10% inflation, it is clear that we are not able to recover most of this money. So it is a certain issue, a certain problem that we have diagnosed. And we try to mitigate this problem. We had a grid connection boom last year. However, it has dropped due to the instability of gas prices. People are afraid of having to pay exorbitant gas bills, but obviously it is not uh, our country, our state to blame. It is due to the global gas prices. And our activities boil down to increasing the connection fee. And if the user is determined and if they want to use gas, then it's simple. If it is a business customer, they will uh, recover the cost uh, uh, tariff and the individual users will be happy to have this gas connection for years. There will, there will be no situations such as getting connected to the gas network and then using wood, for example, to heat their homes. So perhaps it will be easier to answer the question for the next speaker. If we have the decade of transition, how far are we from getting back to discussions about liberalizing or freeing up the prices? I think that in the shorter term of the next 12 months, we need to focus on how to um, quickly translate or transfer these costs, increasing costs in tariffs in a smooth manner. And this is up to the ERO. In order to be on the safe side with our projects, we need to have our costs covered by the tariffs. As you have mentioned, gentlemen, we will have to look for possibilities to diversify uh, fuel sources. Of course, heat pumps. We will also think about building storages. First of all, 24-hour storages and ultimately perhaps seasonal heat storages. But this requires enormous amounts of money. And again, we have to look towards the National Environmental Fund because we are unable to implement that on our own. With three, in the context of offshore wind projects, Seasonal heat storages make a lot of sense. And there's yet another possibility that we have not discussed yet. Our diversification towards renewables will happen on various levels. There will be no leading renewable energy source. Today, out of 10% of renewables in our energy mix, more than 90% is covered by biomass. What's, what happens with biomass in case of war? Well, the prices are going up uh, and there is a problem with, uh, with availability. So we'll have to diversify also all renewables. And we need to use all possibilities including municipal waste, and which have checked it. The energy potential of highly calorific residual fraction of municipal waste, if we use that, we can replace 10% of coal that is currently 
used in our units. But only three conditions have to be met. First of all, waste incineration plants have to be deemed taxonomy compliant, because then we will have the possibility to acquire public funds to implement our projects. Secondly, uh, heat from waste can, uh, must have to be considered waste heat, uh, especially with regard to heat for 55 and the definition of a highly efficient heating system. After 2035, uh, cogeneration shouldn't be considered as positive. And we ha have to fight for that because it is the most um, efficient and most positive technology. And thirdly, all installations uh, burning waste uh, with codes of 19 or 20, uh, or highly calorific waste, must not be covered by the ETS system. And there are some discussions at the European level uh, that starting 2027, these installations will or might be covered with the ETS. So this diversification is extremely important from our, from our point of view, and we need to utilize each of these components. If we are able to do that in the perspective of the next 12 or 24 months, in parallel we have to think about changing the regulatory model because the cost formula uh, is, has been outdated for quite a lot of time. Uh, like the Minister has mentioned, using island operation, we cannot be uh, limited or restricted by the regulation framework because we will not be selling gigajoules, we will sell heating comfort, so we'll have to ensure a certain level of temperatures um, at uh, the premises of our customers. So we need to get rid, get detached from the gigajoule price. And this is the direction that will have to be pursued in parallel with technology changes. We will not be connected or attached to the grid. We'll have to look at island operation to reduce the parameters uh, of our networks, because then it is possible to use renewables. But in parallel with that, we'll have to change the regulations. So this is the perspective of several years. But for, the, for the next 12, 12 plus months, it's hard to foresee it's hard to forecast, but we'll have, we'll need to have a possibility to quickly cover the costs in the tariffs. And what's also important, national legislation must allow us to transfer the costs for all sources, including cogeneration sources, cogeneration units. As mentioned earlier, it is impossible to implement our investment projects if connection costs cannot be covered. No company, big or small, can uh, cover their projects in such a way. They, have, they need to have a possibility to transfer the costs or to cover these costs in the tariffs. And also in parallel, let me mention that again, uh, on a national, local level and individual company level, we need to communicate and we need to talk to our off-takers and customers and explain the situation to them. I don't want to take too much of your time, but two years ago we started a program within our organization, 20 degrees for climate. And some companies, some CEOs were telling us, what, what are you promoting? We uh, studied that the uh, average temperature in our homes is 22 degrees. And we uh, started convincing our residents to keep the thermal comfort at the temperature level of 20 degrees. Was it against our own interest? No. We uh, we're explaining that we had to think about not a single tariff, we had to think about dozens of years into the future, saving on heating costs, uh, also more healthy. We will emit less CO2. And in this current crisis, crisis situation, we have yet another component. We will burn less coal, and we have shortage of coal. So this prospective, future-oriented thinking is necessary. You cannot only focus on um, facing uh, the crisis. 
and overcoming the crisis. But we need to think about coming back to normality and development in five, in five or ten years from now. Okay, let's remember the 25th Gastron Conference uh, by uh, the fact that the, some good news have been also been mentioned. Uh, so, Minister, can you give us some good news for Gastron attendees? Well, just choose one. Choose one good news. Let me just add something to uh, this statement about reducing temperatures at households. We believe it is an extremely important direction. And at the Ministry of Climate, we are also thinking and planning to have a communication on this matter. It is one of the recommendations of the International Energy Agency, which is already recommending on international forums reducing household temperatures by one degree. One degree is sufficient. So the International Energy Agency is estimating the benefits, not only savings for citizens, for residents, but also benefits for the climate. So these are very important activities that we should take. And such commitments or such programs should be implemented and should be communicated. So it is a very good direction indeed. I don't know who was the first to invent, to come up with this program, but I can see uh, cohesion, consistency and compliance between uh, these activities uh, of the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency and the Heating Chamber of Commerce. Good news. One good news for all of us is that Energy security is ensured with full responsibility, with full awareness. And we want energy security not only related to individual customers, uh, but also to collective of takers, companies, large industries, this energy security will be guaranteed. So this is good news that I would like to convey. And summarizing this panel, let me say that the government is taking a high-level care of energy security. All programs, all activities, all ideas go in uh, that direction in uh, aim at ensuring energy security and heating security in our country. So this is the message that should uh, also be conveyed here at Gaster. Thank you, Minister. I know that uh, we are uh, that you are uh, pressed for time. So thank you very much for your participation in this meeting. What else is there that we don't know? When we started discussing the reducing the temperature, let me start from a fact that I heard from my colleague working in Germany. Some time ago, Germany faced the energy problem and gas problem, and they reduced temperature in swimming pools by 2 degrees centigrade. By regulatory measures and uh, now I remember an anecdote related to the de to decreasing temperatures for health reasons uh, do you remember this feel this Polish film sex Misia? it was like in 1970s it was possible to reduce the temperature of our body by two degrees we would live twice longer considering all chemical, biological processes that will take, that will be slowed down. Good news. What are the good news that you can share with us, Mr. Minister? In general, we would like the gas networks and those island solutions in micro networks. We would like to have green gas in as much as possible, whether it's going to be biomethane or any other gas suitable. This is something we'd like to focus on, and we've already started our talks 
And we'd like to share this good news. You know, perhaps we should start developing biomethane plants and the heat unused will also be utilized. We are going to calculate that carefully, but where biogas plants are not feasible and we have gas network, we can perhaps distribute biomethane that can be green, and this will help us to make our system greener. Although there are not that many biomethane plants, perhaps there was not enough pressure to build new ones, and then biomethane is used where it is actually needed. And at the same time, we diversify supplies. There are going to be micro supplies within the entire volume of transmission. This is going to be at a micro scale. And we will stabilize the network just as we try to do with the power grid. So, if you agree to connect. Well, the Polish gas company is a modern company. We establish a project focusing on the transmission of hydrogen as well as all other admixture gases. We just need financial support. Our ambition is to modernize our system, to build new connections, and we're going to start this autumn, this fall. We can build new pipelines, modern pipelines, suitable for the transportation of all gases that we may wish in the future. We have this testing ground where we test the transmission of hydrogen, and we just need Pre President Michalski to say that he would support us. We still have some time. We're not in a rush. Some good news for the market to conclude our panel. I am optimistic and I'd like to contradict that an optimist is a less informed a pessimist. We are informed. We are responsible as a sector. This is the program of promoting district heating started 15 years ago. We developed communication with our clients, and the program of reducing temperature is a part of the process. And I believe this is going to be a positive tool to communicate with our clients to attract new ones and cooperation between sectors. We are very open to cooperate with the gas industry, to cooperate with the power sector, and we no longer focus on what was typical for our business during the past 30 years, we think how to use new technologies, how to reach out for external sources of funding, and the cooperation with the government is very important for us, with your ministry, Minister, Minister, and this is also an optimistic message that in our relations, we can use our relations to develop good legislative solu solutions. And once having such a comprehensive approach to the development of the sector, we will survive the difficulties. It's going to be difficult, but at the same time, in 20 or 24 months, 
We're going to use this time as a springboard to expedite the modernization of our sector. A very important message from the 25th Gaster. Thank you very much for the panel. We finished five minutes earlier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and I'd like to invite everyone to lunch, and we shall meet in this room at 2.
Państwa, otwieram ostatnią sesję konferencji Gaster. Ladies and gentlemen, let me open the final session of the Gaster Conference. My już z kolei. Czy aktualne wydarzenia redefiniowały koncepcję cyberbezpieczeństwa? Partnerem panelu jest firma Exatel, moderator Jakub Wiech, zastępca redaktora naczelnego Energii Partner for the panel is Exatel. Prowadzenie Robert Perkowski, wiceprezes zarządu PNG. Jakub Wiech is going to be moderator and the introductory speech will be delivered by Robert Perkowski. We are going to discuss what are offensive security skills and why have they become crucial outlook and principles for establishing and developing the security operations center 
Major security functionality is expected in IT products. What are key products to be included in industrial automation cybersecurity projects and modern technologies and improvement of cybersecurity? Let me give the floor to the moderator and please proceed with the panel. Jakub Wiech, do we have Jakub Wiech with us? Aha, co to może, może pan, pan prezes rozpocznie, bo tak to wprowadzenie może, może w międzyczasie... Then in the meantime, we'll listen to the introductory speech by Robert Perkowski. I understand this is the right panel and the right place for me to share some thoughts with you. I sincerely hope that the discussion during the panel will be lively, involving different models, different approaches to offensive cyber security. I'm sure of one certain thing that recent months redefined a number of things, a number of things in terms of security, not only cyber security, which was an introduction to the physical wall and aggression in Ukraine. We witnessed a number of hacker attacks, not only in Ukraine, because the offensive and defensive possibilities were tested much earlier before the physical military aggression. For certain, what we witness redefined a lot of things or blurred our imagination regarding the only right security model. I embody a certain approach that the most security is what we have here, a plug that we can pull out of a socket and we have full control over our hard disks. At a certain hour, the entire country of Ukraine and various institutions with such an, institu such an approach would not be able to function. Cloud has become the need of a moment that enable operations not only companies, banking institutions, but the entire Ukrainian state. It has become an area of attacks, hacker attacks, and attempts to take over domains and cloud resources, including sensitive data. Today, there is no single solution that can provide full security. Well, who of you responsible for cyber security in your company or organization, though you are convinced that you do the best things possible, who looked into the switch or a computer to be certain that it consists of only of components that you actually ordered? You. I understand you have not. Damage the piece of equipment. And who of you, using software that is used not only to provide office packages and to secure resources we are responsible, enter the code to check that the software is secure, is a secure tool. My congratulations, but I refer in general to certain assumptions that we make today. We assume, but uh, we cannot be certain. Software and the programmer have no, uh, has no idea how it functions. They use certain libraries. This applies not only to small applications, but large 
pieces of software. Tak naprawdę burząc wszystkich i krytykując w pewnym sensie. While criticizing everyone, what else can I say? If you want to have the sense that we meet the expectations of the business and our company, we need to select a unique path that will combine resources available in the optimal way to meet the goals. Let me give an example of Smartfield that we established in the Polish oil and gas. The beginning was difficult, but the objective of the program was to optimize resources and IT technologies to use the computing cloud technology, uh, which is very tempting, a very tempting technology, giving a lot of opportunities. Let's imagine that we have Polish gas and oil dealing with prospecting and extracting oil and gas. These are not simple processes of drilling a hole. Before drilling a hole, they need to have a large probability and the, the, the borehole itself may, cost, may be costly, but people need to be certain that resources will be there and will be available. This seismic picture, which is the first step in the survey of a deposit, can encompass one terabyte data, or petabyte data. Uh, this might be surprising to some of you. Of course, it's a question of processing such data and the business value that we obtain while processing such a large volume of data is growing. And we are aware that uh, processed data correlated with other information regarding boreholes and previous surveys. In order to optimize our investment, we need to create a model and simulate the operation of the deposit throughout the period of its operation. And these processes occupy a lot of memory and require significant computing power. Uh, up until recently, it took one month to compute everything. Now we shortened that to a couple of days, and while using a computing cloud, we will be able to use the capacity and shorten the a period to several minutes, and this is something tempting. This is something that allows us to be more open to security. We see that we need actually everything, not only physical security with our hand on a switch, but uh, tools that will enable to push our company forward. That's why the solution that we used is a solution that you are familiar with. It's a hybrid solution that you uses all possible, all possibility, the public cloud, private cloud, but also non-cloud resources. I'd like to encourage you to a lively discussion during the panel. If I inspired anyone, I would be happy uh, to discuss it with you. And I'd like to wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Do we have our moderator here? Oh, there you go. Yes, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jakub Wiech. I'm deputy editor-in-chief of Energetica 24, and I'll have the honor to chair the panel devoted to a specific dimension of security that often evades our attention uh, at events such as Gaster, where we mostly focus on hard physical security, as mentioned by Mr. Perkowski in his introduction, and indicating the possibility to uh, plug, uh, to pull the plug uh, 
of our assets. Here, we will talk about something more abstract or ephemeral, uh, cyber security and how it affects the functioning of the energy sector in a significant manner, and this importance will increase. And we'll discuss that during our panel with our distinguished guests, Mr. Krzysztof Deki, CEO of ComCert, We'll have Mr. Karol Vrubel, Director of Cyber Security Department at Exatel. We'll also have Mr. Wojciech Zajchowski from uh, Solutions Architect from NTT. Mr. Jarosław Zarychta, Cloud Business Development Manager for, at Google Cloud. Mr. Tomasz Figura, Director of the IT Department at PGNIG. Mr. Piotr Banaszewski, Software Sales Executive at Microfocus. Mr. Piotr Jakubik, CEO of uh, Prometheus and Mr. Sebastian Pelowski, uh, head of uh, cybersecurity department at PGNIG. Gentlemen, I tried to introduce, uh, to make an introduction for uh, our attendees to the topics of our panel. Among people dealing with cybersecurity, this reality is being redefined. The dynamic situation beyond our eastern border creates new fields and new threats in the field of cybersecurity and new possibilities to breach cybersecurity. But I would like to make an introduction to our attendees, uh, to have an introduction for our attendees by someone from the industry. So, Krzysztof, what has changed since the 24th of February? How dynamic uh, is the situation? And uh, what can we expect? I can see that our president, our CEO, has opened this discussion and he stole the show. Thank you very much for staying with us, fortunately. It was a great introduction and a lot of aspects have been mentioned. Let me conclude them or summarize them to prove that I have been listening. When compiling this intervention, we need to point out two specific facts uh, to simplify it, to, to boil it down to the supply chain. So we need to talk about the security of the supply chain that was mentioned by our CEO. So what do we purchase and from whom and whether we trust them? Then I would like to point out to certification and laboratories uh, CEO, the CEO mentioned that we do not do it, but why don't we do it? There are no such possibilities, not only in Poland, but also in the whole EU. We, there is no such uh, center, certification body, um, and it should be established. Where the, the question is whether there is a possibility to do that. No national or European body can do what our CEO asked about. So it was a rhetorical question. The crux of the issue is that there is there are no bodies certifying the security of software. Some people say, yes, I can do it, we, but we can do it when we have source codes. But what happens when we do not have source codes? You, we have a device and we do not have source codes, so reverse engineering, and then no one would raise their hand. This is very important. So, the essence of the question, what has changed? Um, apart from the United States, we are a leader in helping Ukraine with what is happening. So, this redefinition that you have mentioned is about looking at who is the aggressor. We are one of the leaders, um, together with the United States, with regard to defensive support to uh, Ukraine, but the aggressor is the number one country in terms of offensive cyber security measures. It's not Israel, it is Russia. Um, Israel is in this distant second place. So this is this new reality. This new threat is about having a very serious player, not only in the same league as ourselves, but not in the same league, uh, higher league than uh, the entire EU. So we have a huge gap 
uh, in favor of Russia and to the detriment of uh, the European Union and uh, Poland. So the dimension of uh, uh, threats is not to, uh, just about vir antivirus software, EDS, EDS, EDS three-letter acronyms. So this cybersecurity is devoted to a different level of threats than the cybersecurity that our CEO asked about. So uh, APT, uh, we have 150 identified factors, um, and we have many unidentified ones. So threats that can attack uh, the hardware component, and not just emails, phishing, or adding something to an Excel spreadsheet. So hardware component attacks, similarly to pe the Pegasus system. So there is no interaction with the user needed. There is no email needed to infect our systems. And it is possible and it is happening, especially and most dynamically in the energy sector, without any user interaction. And if we look at investments in this sector, uh, similarly to the, uh, the other sectors, like the banking sector, fin financial sector, we, we invest in um, anti-phishing, EDS, uh, and other antivirus systems, and we do not address these threats. The matter that is not understood by uh, Microsoft, Google, FireEye, or uh, other victims of those cyber criminals, mainly Russians, but not only. Could you outline, if it's possible, what part of its potential, of Russia's potential, has been used so far in terms of attacking the European Union, in terms of cyber threats? It's a difficult question. Against Poland, almost none. I discussed that from the very first days of the conflicts. So far, there have not, there have been no attacks so far, no attacks so far for, on the part of Russia. There were some attacks commented by uh, analysts, professors. They were not professional attacks, cyber attacks. A DDoS attack is not a serious cyber attack, regardless of its volume. And we only were able to read about such attacks. So those were not serious attacks. So for Poland, there was not even a single introduction. And speaking of Poland, uh, we might go back to what's happened on state railways. So a surprising um, failure of Ebilog 950 devices, components manufactured by Bombardier in Moscow. We know that from business policy um, paper. And th this unexplained failure and this supply chain security issue. We trust the um, board of uh, Polish Railways and we believe that it is that it was an IT failure. But the fact that um, the manufacturing process and geography is a big question mark. Let Let's remember a company too fast. What did they do in uh, those devices? Transmission protocols and cybersecurity. It was a Moscow-based company. But let's assume it really was a failure. Uh, it was questioned by the um, business policy paper. As for the European Union, there are some media announcements and our own uh, internal information from our CTI, uh, from our intelligence center. There are increasing attacks on the energy and financial sector. The attacks that I am talking about were traditional IT and uh, traditional cybersecurity structures, existing structures, do not have a clue what is happening. IT says we do not know what's happening and cybersecurity should uh, address that, and they say, well, uh, we have, they have a lot of tools, but they do not know what's going on. It's happening, it's working after some time, but we do not know what has happened. This is taking place in power plants, especially in wind power plants, and it is on the rise. So these are the symptoms that I was talking about, and the worst part is that we are not ready in terms of technology and competences. We focus on antivirus uh, software, uh, which uh, place in ranking, uh, it occupies uh, Windows Defender, Symantec, elsewhere, and anything else. What we should focus on to simplify it for our audience 
audience, simplifying, is Pegasus. Which company did um, uh, explain the infection with Pegasus? None. Where was uh, Microsoft, FireEye, Broadcom, Symantec? They, they all remain silent. So how does Pegasus work? Well, maybe it's too difficult. How WhatsApp was infected by Pegasus? You will not find that information. Try mm, check me uh, in the afternoon. I'll be here until tomorrow. So if we do not know how Pegasus works, and I claim that Russia has much bigger potential than Israel, and it is built on uh, Russian intellectual potential, let's multiply those threats from Pegasus and let's think whether we are ready for those threats in the industry. TSO, DSO, uh, in the energy sector, but also in any other sector, if we do not know how Pegasus works when multiplying those threats, and it doesn't come from one single Israeli company called NSO, it comes from the Russian government, it gives you an answer to this question, whether it is happening and how ready we are, how prepared we are. And we do not know completely how Pegasus or how one of its tricks um, worked uh, without any user interaction, how WhatsApp is infected. But I don't want to take too long. Thank you very much. Well, that was a dramatic introduction. And it brought our attention to the fact that this silence that we hear now can be a silence before a very disastrous and destructive storm. Uh, in Poland, we do not have to be very much afraid in terms of geopolitics, because on the map of desired victims of Russia, we are not at the top of the list. We are uh, non, an unimportant uh, target in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, when I was asked about potential of attack in the first days of the conflict, I said that we are not a player for Russia. Russia will not reveal its uh, nuclear weaponry of cybersecurity in our beloved country. On the technology arena, we are no, uh, no player here in this game. Uh, a lot is happening and there is still a long way ahead of us. So one optimistic news from me is that uh, as much as Russia is not likely to use nuclear weapons, it's probably not going to use uh, its nuclear cyber weapons against Poland. It could use them against uh, the United States. So it's good to be a humble player. So let's come back to Mr. Vrubel. I heard that we, we just heard that we are not under attack, under cyber attacks from Russia. But perhaps we should get ready for that, for using, uh, using tests that can be carried out by companies and how we can these, uh, diagnose these risks. With regard to what has been mentioned earlier, this threat has been presented to the general public because earlier both companies and people dealing with cybersecurity were aware of the fact that uh, red teaming and uh, penetration tests are very important to verify the capabilities in confrontation with a really determined attacker. Because, in my opinion, the security of various entities at a time where we do not have a real threat just beyond our border is built, as mentioned by Krzysztof, based on cybersecurity platforms. We focus on antivirus software. We do not think about our experts, about exercises, processes, procedures and verification. In the beginning of this year, at Exatel, we had our activities planned that coincided with the current situation. But working uh, with a technology company, it is easier for me to uh, speak about, talk about what can be done internally. So it is slightly easier from the point of view of uh, a company like ours. So what I have done, I ask everyone to work from the basics, tests, verification, for simplest processes, 
zdefiniowane, And this attack is targeted at a cer certain company, if, if it is successful, and it probably will be successful with the current condition of cybersecurity, regardless of what we think, how good it is. Uh, the most important thing is to is being able to restore the core aspects of company's functioning and support uh, uh, functionalities. With regard to routining uh, tests, I'm a big supporter of such solutions. I have been talking about that for many years, even with regard to several days testing, so that a company or a group of systems should be confronted with people who have offensive competences. Uh, uh, to know how to look for vulnerabilities, for loopholes, and how to break those vulnerabilities. Because it gives us a lot with regard to the general picture of how to plan uh, our activities in a situation of a real threat threat of a real attack. Many companies focus on uh, cybersecurity platforms. They are not always optimally implemented or uh, implemented in a way that would allow to use their potential. So key to success is elsewhere, in my opinion. That is competences, offensive verification, and work with the basics at the foundations uh, with regard to capability of restorations of systems and um, preventing or hampering uh, an attack uh, from our uh, enemies and how to build a team that is necessary for that process. It is an interesting question indeed. There is certainly a shortage of competent people on the market, significant shortage, and the responsibility for all of us is to try to help certain people develop in this offensive direction. Since uh, becoming the head of cybersecurity uh, at Exatel three years ago, our offensive team has grown, has tripled. I tried to en encourage uh, companies on the market, telling them that it was very important to carry out offensive verification, which is very helpful for us. With regard to selection of staff, of personnel, it, is, it will be very difficult to build an in-house team. If you decide to do that, the majority of your companies have some components or some um, existing teams, but in my opinion, some partnerships with proven partners on the market will be necessary. Otherwise, we will not be able to cope with these issues. That is outsourcing. Yes, to a certain extent, of course, that depends on the size of the company, and you, it's always worth having some of these competences in-house, on board, uh, to verify the services carried out by external companies or to double check, which is already becoming very popular in the market. And I'm very glad to see that, that supervision of works uh, is carried out by separate experts, independent experts, who are, who are able to assess the quality of work. Thank you very much. We've heard about the scale of risk, threat, ways of influencing our systems to improve resilience. And from your point of view, from the point of view of the IT department director, how you How do you select security systems? Welcome. While discussing IT and security, I frequently use an analogy of medicine. A company is a hospital. And I, or security managers, directors of IT departments, Directors of 
hospitals. To, czego my potrzebujemy, to są takie need, leki, medykamenty i sprzęt medyczny, uh, które przychodzą do nas, nasi pacjenci. No i teraz, jakie patients, mamy problemy w tym patients. szpitalu, powiedziałbym, w obszarze bezpieczeństwa. No możemy je podzielić, powiedziałbym, na takie choroby popularne, przeziębienia, grypy, etc., wirusy, Problems such as viruses, the common cold, the cough, and serious diseases. And every illness is specific, and we need to apply a specific approach. In the case of a regular flu, this includes. To jest, Identity, to jest theft, it's a plague. Z tym trzeba walczyć, This is something we need to fight with, to prowadzi do bardzo wielu poważnych chorób. To a number of other serious illnesses. Czasach, że we are living in times that we digitalized a number of areas of our life. In the past, we went to a post office, we made a money transfer, we went to a shop, bought things. Now we keep receiving text messages. Money transfers, uh, information about packages sent, we receive information whether our child is at school or not. We are snowed under information banks, institutions of public trust write to us and also other organizations. Wszystkie podmioty podszywać. Więc i to jest olbrzymi problem, tak? Czyli, want to write to us, and they use other institutions' identities. So this applies to all systems, not only technological systems, but also processes. I, as an owner of a problem, I'm interested in applying a system approach, a comprehensive approach. I do not want to buy a tool. I want to buy a comprehensive solution to implement it. At the first stage, it's just the beginning. I want my people to be familiar how to use the tool, and I want well trained, my well personnel to stay with the within the organization. This is a regular problem of this proverbial hospital. Another good example is something that up until recently was discussed by the media. We have hospitals, they provide various procedures and suddenly hospitals stop functioning. The same applies to security. We need to ensure continuity of the process. We need to take a holistic, comprehensive approach. There are certain things that we do not understand, we cannot cope with, and it will always be like that, and we need different class of solutions. If we do not understand the nature of a phenomenon, we can observe symptoms, and all systems that monitor deviations from the behavior of applications and users is also the right way, because they can help us to verify directions of attack that we are not familiar with. We need to know why an application would like wants to reach certain resources that were restricted, why a certain user wants to access uh, databases that have not never been accessed before. So I need a comprehensive solution. I do not want to buy individual devices, applications. This will not solve the problem. And concluding my intervention, this hybrid model is obvious and necessary. As if we wanted to build a wonderful hospital with all possible wards. Is it possible? Some people say that everything is the function of money and time, but there's shortage either one or the other. While staying with this metaphor of a hospital, some hospitals do not diagnose certain diseases, they do not have specialists and equipment relevant for that. 
ale czy wobec tego But faktycznie trzeba budować w każdym szpitalu taką poliklinikę, czy może po prostu outsourcować multiple w jakiś ward sposób hospitals, części tych kompetencji can outsource na większym wyspecjalizowanych uh, odpowiednio zasobne to, uh, placówki? Well prepared organizations. Myślę, że... Idee to jedno, a praktyka the idea is one thing, and practice and real possibilities is the other thing. In our current market situation, there is no such possibility. Let's consider rates, remuneration rates of IT specialists, especially in the area of security. Many organizations are not able to employ such people either through their internal policy or other regulations. They are not able to no i co attract zrobić? such people. No, rozumiem, że można szkolić, of course, you can train komórki, your staff or internal poziom. units. E, tak jak but wcześniej tu rozmawialiśmy, as previously e, mentioned to nie jest during tak, the panel, it's not that cyber security is just a game of unprofessional hackers. It's business. If we have business working against us, how can we defend ourselves at the level of an individual company? There are large companies, wealthy companies, and they can designate a relevant budget for security, like banks. But even this sector is aware that individually they are not able to do much. That's why they integrate, they build common processes. And I, as an operator of the critical infrastructure, I would like and I would expect the support not only from my competent colleagues from the security department, but also on the part of specialized state units or entities. Let us stay for a while uh, in the gas sector, and I'd like to address Mr. Pelowski. Cisco GK PGNIG. What are the competences and what are the possibilities to develop relevant competences in companies such as PGNIG? How to fit people with relevant skills and competences to improve your resilience. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Just as my colleague has mentioned, frequently we have a relevant team, we have an incident, nobody knows what happened, and we need to wait for the solution. And there are no relevant offensive competences. And then the team closes an incident and we have a gap in the system. So our members of staff do not know how to solve it. It's frequently difficult to address, to request an external company for help. No i w tym momencie zostaje budowanie kompetencji ofensywnych. And then we just need to develop offensive competencies. Jest to realizowane poprzez In our case we do it budowanie zespołu by building a cyber security team. Łączymy we combine offensive and defensive competencies in one team. Koleżankę koleżanka i koledzy, którzy są na pierwszej i drugiej linii. Our colleagues at the first and second line of the organization undergo offensive cybersecurity training. And there actually we have a gap on the Polish market. It's very difficult to organize such training. I'm not talking about theoretical training that takes one or two days. I'm referring rather to offensive security training that build up certain level of knowledge among our staff that will work on the second and third line, people capable of supporting Exatel from the point of view of our tests and other competences implemented and used in the capital group. Why we decided to develop the team? Because in 2018, we had a team exercise in one of our companies in the group. We had desired results. 
on our part and we received an agreement, a consent, an approval of our uh, board to proceed that way. And for the past several years, we improved the competence within the competences within the team. What is the time framework to develop offensive cybersecurity competences? Let me answer like a lawyer. It depends. If we want to have purely theoretical knowledge in the team, we can do it very quickly. We move towards hands-on solutions. We want to develop practical skills. Our colleagues need to have experience in offensive measures, and they succeed while solving current security incidents. Thank you very much. As a lawyer, I appreciate, appreciate your answer. Now let me address uh, Mr. Zarechta. In the first interventions, we heard a dramatic warning against uh, all possible threats. And on the other hand, we think about it very seriously, but we would like the cyber sector to develop. Aren't you afraid that the threats that we will keep hearing about because Russia will try to use their potential against uh, a certain country, but this, don't you, aren't you afraid that people may be afraid of cloud solutions, or maybe this has already happened? Thank you very much for the question. Customers leaving leaving uh, cloud solutions uh, is a phenomenon that uh, has already taken place. If you had a chance to read the F5 report, uh, the authors of the report focused on several large enterprises uh, in the who decided to use cloud technology, and right now a number of these companies still before the uh, deplorable invasion of Russia in Ukraine decided to uh, depart from such solutions. What are the reasons? It's worth mentioning them for those of you who are not familiar with the report. Uh, cloud, computing cloud technology years ago was the emerging technology and competences were at a much lower level and failure and failure to migrate like shift and lift of IT infrastructure of a given corporation to a cloud uh, were not always the best solution possible. So now we have much more scenarios, many more scenarios to shift to the computing cloud, and we have a different technique to develop applications that can operate in multiple cloud environments and in hybrid environments as well. The war in, I don't think that the war in Ukraine expedited the process. Uh, this is a too short time for large corporations to decide and to take some steps to return on tram uh, solutions. But in terms of our presence in Poland, and I can speak for the organization that I represent, we do not see such trend. But there is a reverse trend. The majority of organizations First, the finance sector, days after the invasion, we received initial requests, not about price and possibility to implement, but to undertake special steps, specific steps to develop 
uh, backups. Backupy takie as is, czyli stają. As is backups. Na chwilę wykonania backupu to najczęściej wykonuje się. And this is usually done by connecting appliance and moving the appliance to a safe location and connecting it to private network in a different time regime in a more safe geographic location. And it's a natural step. It's logical, since the war is going on just several kilometers from our border and there are missiles flying that can destroy targets within minutes or seconds. A natural step to be taken by heads of security departments in companies to undertake and secure their data wymaga dłuższych analiz i projektów budowania środowisk zapasowych. Developing backup environment. So this might be another feature of what happened after the 24th of February. We first witnessed increase in request for golden backups and then the requests to Google Cloud coming is the development of a backup center for large organizations. Even if they already have such centers, they need to modernize uh, to create certain redundancies, which is also logical because as it has been mentioned in the panel, they would like to build hybrid centers and it seems to be the right step to be taken because of the diversification, geographic diversification of data location. And I already invited you to our first anniversary of Google Cloud Center in Warsaw. And people request to shift their data to other more distant locations. And the final issue that I would like to raise regarding changes on the market and the approach to cloud technology in cybersecurity, I can see interest in hybrid environments, not only DRC, not only copies, but in many instances, the industry implements projects on building hybrid environments. So some applications remain where they are, but their copies and possibilities to connect to them are shifted to the computing cloud and despite longer latency, they choose locations close to uh, our border, but not in Poland. And in our case, it's usually Frankfurt. So if I can come back to the first question that you asked regarding uh, any redefinition of the idea of cybersecurity after the invasion, I can emphasize that this already, the redefinition already happened during the previous crisis, namely the coronavirus pandemic. During that time, overnight, for objective reasons, a number of operations that we did manually or in a hybrid manner, organizations had to shift online, which means more traffic online. So in case of organizations that are not, they do not have good intentions to cooperate with the public and other institutions, these organizations uh, wanted to launch their attacks there. So the cybersecurity has already been redefined and people became more aware of security needs and what we witness today, in my humble assessment, we can say that there is a change of the paradigm in terms of the approach to cybersecurity. Previously, it was a question of logic. People were less afraid of the physical uh, security of data. 
mniej się wypowiadam o przedsiębiorstwach związanych z I'm referring to large industry companies, energy sector and chemical production that I'm most familiar with. They were well prepared regarding their own data centers. And they need, they do not need that much cloud services, but today's situation, when the physical security of facilities where companies keep their data uh, is at risk, they change the paradigm. So this physical security comes into play and decisions that are made focus on providing, first of all, physical security of information and possibilities to develop copies, to be able to restore data of a financial institution, for instance, collecting information about our finances, uh, while destroying one or the other data center that are frequently located one next to the other, no, bez wyniesienia tych danych y, poza granicę w teoretycznie would be miejsca, mówię teoretycznie, bo very undesirable. So organizations would like to shift their data to safe locations. Thank you very much. Next question goes to Mr. Zajkowski. We mentioned about the change in attitudes or approach towards cyber, cyber security solutions after the 24th of February in the context of the cloud. We touched upon some other things, but from your point of view, what is most in interesting to your clients from industrial automation sector. Has there been any change after the 24th of February or any change in the attitudes towards specific solutions or perhaps some new questions based on the current developments beyond uh, Polish eastern border? Thank you. Let me start by saying that industrial network security, at least among our direct clients, comparing it to IT uh, systems is Several is lagging back several years or more than 10 years. So from the point of view of someone working in financial security, for example, some of our solutions may seem primitive, but that's what the facts are. Industrial networks or industrial systems as such have been physically separated so far and virtually separated from the global network. However, this is changing. And we are witnessing a trend when, where a number of systems require connection with the cloud, for example. And this is nothing bad in itself. There's nothing wrong with it. But with regard to those connections, certain threats appear. For example, a minor configuration error may lead to a situation where there is open access from the internet to our network or to a certain device in the network. There may be some devices that haven't been updated or upgraded for more than 10 years. They have some security loopholes or vulnerabilities that can be used by the attackers. But coming back to the expectations of our clients, based on the discussions and multiple projects completed, there is a clear picture that the client's expectations are as follows. We should implement a comprehensive system to monitor and protect the network, but in any way it cannot influence the operation of the company in any way, including network communication. So the only system that can meet those requirements is a passive monitoring system, a passive monitoring system for the entire network communications. And in 90% of cases, we implement such passive systems. This means that the entire traffic from the industrial network is copied to a certain server. It can be an on-prem server or a virtual server, but mo most customers uh, decide to use on-site physical servers in installed within their own infrastructure, and such a server or a system installed on that server carries out real-time analysis of data, and in case of detecting any anomalies or threats, it warns or alerts the user. 
But that's the only thing they can do. The majority of our clients are not ready to install a system in their industrial networks to actively block any unwanted network communications. It may be a weird, a bizarre approach, but as you know, any downtime or change in the manufacturing process may have much more dangerous consequences in an industrial network rather than in an IT network. Stopping a server will cost us only money or time or nothing if we have a backup server. And stopping an industrial network, manufacturing network, may, cost, may have a cost of human lives in the worst case scenario. So it is understandable to see this approach from the clients who expect these systems not to affect the operation of the network. Their expectations also include the fact that they, these systems should not only prevent and secure their operation, it should be something more than that. So their expectations include uh, taking the inventory of uh, the entire network and protocols, devices and protocols used in all the networks. So. Basically, all our clients reach a certain point where we connect a system monitoring the network communications and we detect devices. And in almost all cases, there is many more devices than the client was aware of installed in their networks. It may be surprising, but these are the facts. Industrial networks are not modified as frequently as typical IT networks, and there are some devices that are 10 or tens of years old that many users forgot about them, but they are still there, they still operate. And if we give them internet access, many bad, bad very bad things can happen. And directly answering your question, we do not see any increasing number, increased number of inquiries after the start of the war in Ukraine. In general, with regard to the level of security of industrial networks and the number of clients interested in the topic, I'm a bit frightened, I'm a bit scared, because these are critical infrastructure systems and not many people are interested in security. What's the difference between a bomb uh, exploding at a certain power plant and the situation where a group of people uh, takes this power plant out of operation or causes a malfunction, uh, killing some employees of that power plant? Thank you very much. But maybe I misunderstood something. Correct me if I'm wrong. So does it mean that the clients want to have something that will operate but will be invisible and also equipped with some functionalities going beyond the general notion of cybersecurity? Yes, perhaps not invisible, but without any, any impact on the industrial network. Okay, the bar is raised very high. Thank you. Question to Mr. Banaszewski. We've heard about the activities and the client's expectations and activities related to threats. And I have an impression that all these factors have one common denominator. The expectation for cybersecurity Security service providers or solution providers are one step ahead of the attackers or enemies who want to threaten our security. Is that possible at all? Is it feasible in our reality? Ladies and gentlemen, I recently had an opportunity to listen to the conversation between Mr. Maciej Kawecki, you all know him, and uh, Mr. Piotr Kawecki from Niebezpiecznik. And the question was whether, can, whether we can be one step ahead of the cyber criminals? And the answer was no. Let me put it like this. Cyber criminals are equipped with certain tools. Of course, they are hiding and they attack us at some point in time. But what we can do, for sure, is what was mentioned by Mr. Perkowski and Krzysztof. At least we could secure our codes, the codes of applications that we write ourselves and the applications that we receive from third-party companies, secure these codes, carry the tests, carry out the tests, just like we have performance and functionality tests for applications, I have an impression that in many organizations there is and there are no security tests of the code themselves, of the codes themselves. You've mentioned that uh, 
Programmers or software developers use uh, libraries from the internet. And these libraries are often left there with certain backdoors by criminal groups. So at the stage of writing an application, developing an application, both programmers and security testers should verify the code that appears, whether this code has any backdoors or vulnerabilities or not. And perhaps this is going one step ahead of cyber criminals. Let me just intervene here. It's quite interesting what you're saying. Isn't it happening, this auto-review process? Isn't it taking place? It varies according to the organization. In many cases, uh, tests for applications uh, refer to different areas, and companies believe that their applications are safe. You've mentioned Bombardier. Uh, we trusted them, everyone trusted them uh, that these devices were safe. It was a big company. And we do not know that for sure, but there might have been something inside in those devices or applications. And there's a similar situation with applications and devices used in IT and not only OT. So it's worth carrying out such tests, it's worth forcing application providers to carry out those tests, and it's worth expecting certain test reports, application test reports. So I think this is the step that we might take. Of course, regardless of other aspects, the gentlemen here have mentioned people, personnel, training. At Microfocus, we uh, have a cyber uh, academy. And we have an interesting platform, and I would like to encourage you, invite you to visit a cyber -esque galaxy. It is an interactive platform where we demonstrate attacks in real time with description of those attacks and we provide feeds, uh, for example, lists of IP addresses or website addresses, um, dangerous website addresses uh, that can be used and implemented in your own firewalls. So cyber -esque Galaxy, please visit us. And our specialists work 24-7 to monitor detect and support our customers, and we also provide additional capacities. From the since the 24th of February, our clients can enjoy additional capacities with regard to our CMOS system, for example. Now question to Mr. Jakubik. You work with drones, which might not be something obvious here with regard to the topic of our panel and the topic of gas term conference as a gas industry conference. Could you tell us something more about how these these uh, devices, how these drones are used in the energy sector and how they fit into the cybersecurity infrastructure. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presence here, my intervention here might be, uh, might not seem obvious here. But if we are talking about drones or UAVs, we are talking about aviation. Drones are unmanned aerial vehicles. And cyber security, in case of aerial vehicles, is much more advanced than in case of mobile, land-based mobile vehicles. It's much more advanced. We all know about autonomous driving. We know that there are automotive companies who want to implement that, trying to implement that. And it is at a certain implementation stage, uh, stage of research. But with regard to drones, to UAVs, it is at a much, at a slightly more advanced level than in case of wheeled vehicles, be it passenger or um, heavy goods vehicles. So, when talking about cybersecurity and drones, it may be associated with the fact that a drone is a threat. We can talk about cybersecurity on two levels, or two sides of the situation. One side, which is most obvious to everyone, is that a drone can 
w zakresie cyberbezpieczeństwa jakiemuś obiektowi. Tak, dron to może być też nośnik, który się wpina do WC, zbiera dane, rozumie dane, może zarazić wirusem, to jest jakby to był główny temat cyberbezpieczeństwa do tej pory. So this is the main cyber security issue related to the drones and discussed at various events with regard to you on aerial vehicles. And in the context of this panel, the importance of cyber security in drones konfliktu zbrojnego. In the context of the armed conflict, we all know that. From the news that the course of military or humanitarian operations is decided by unmanned systems that also indicate certain directions for future actions. If we look at the Second World War and its tragedy, dozens of years ago, it was mostly tanks and aircraft. Piloted aircraft, manned aircraft with radio communications. Today, it's mostly drones that are being used. And listening to your to the interventions from previous speakers, we need to mention three important aspects with regard to cyber security of drones of UAVs, not as a threat, but as a service, service that has to be provided. The first thing, and let me use the example of what we are doing at Prometheus, and it's always nice to hear some real-life examples. The first thing is GPS spoofing. If we take a, an ordinary drone, a typical drone, it works... Uh, with GPS in a certain band and one threat that we are facing is that someone might break into our system, might breach our system and change the flight trajectory. And it's not just about armed conflicts or military attacks. Please imagine a situation where we are in a member of one of the projects of Digital Poland where our drones, mainly not those that are presented there, this is the most recent model, we've worked two years on this. Our drones uh, are used for the so-called intelligent municipalities uh, and certain functionalities will be used, well-known functionalities like monitoring of the municipal area, uh, fire alerting, uh, notifying the fire guard, fire brigade, geomapping, and so on. But, among others, such a drone with a certain payload capacity, it can carry out some rescue functions. And one of such functions is to deliver an AED device, a defibrillator device. If we do not prevent uh, such threats with regard to breaching our GPS uh, flight, we might risk uh, that a situation where a drone will not reach the target and we will not provide the equipment or deliver the equipment on time. So every minute counts in terms of saving lives. I'm not uh, an IT specialist, but but it is a bit a bit about a bit related to IoT and the Internet of Things and. This drone is, is a part of that IoT domain, and we can connect various devices to that. It can be cameras, it can be AEDs, defibrillators, or even fire extinguishers. One of our drones provides a quick fire extinguishing system. So this is the first level. The second thing is data transfer. I think the biggest threat, both in the civil context and in the military context, we only manufacture civil, uh, civilian drones. But the mo biggest threat is uh, breaching the networks and uh, stealing the data. So the value of the data determines the scale of the problem that, they, that our client can be subjected to. I shouldn't praise or boast about our drones, but we are 
fully secure in terms of data transfer and so far our systems have not been breached and we are working on it not due to the situation in Ukraine but we have been working on it uh, for many years and we are the only ones in Poland I think uh, we are able to use the GSM network, which means that we can operate a drone, control a drone from here and carry out a task in Zakopane. And at the same time, we can uh, fly automatically to 1.5 thousand waypoints. It's not that the pilot goes to sleep after entering the waypoints and wakes up several hours later because our drones can fly for up to five hours, but we can relieve the pilot slightly. It is based on classical aviation where, apart from takeoff and landing, most aircraft are uh, using autopilot. And the third thing, now let me just add here that we have uh, we've had positive protocol tests with Starlink from Elon Musk. It is not very advanced, but we are also discussing it with uh, Sat Evolution about aggregation and uh, securing our data through the satellite. And the one last thing with regard to cybersecurity are the facilities themselves. Uh, a drone can always fall onto a certain facility, a certain site. I'm not talking about drones that are designed to um, to have to make an impact on a certain site or object. We know these drones in Ukraine, but this may happen. This is something that may happen by accident. Our company has systems uh, preventing such situations. For example, a drone may fall um, due to lack of network coverage or so-called jamming. We have 200 kilometers of range and we have an anti-jamming system allowing our drones to fly without GSM coverage and if there is uh, purposeful interference, it can fly for tens of kilometers. Thank you very much. You have uh, established these drones in the realities of uh, Ukrainian war. Uh, it's it's, they are even present in pop culture with the song by Raktar uh, about the drones that uh, are so famous and uh, so successful against Russian soldiers. You've mentioned the threats related to the use of drones. Are there any ways to encourage customers to treat drones, UAVs, as something that is a natural part of industrial processes, something that is safe and something that can be used in crisis situations. For example, if a drone responds to certain accidents or incidents that can threaten human life to provide some assistance, and are there any ways to convince people that drones are safe and beneficial? Well, it's very difficult. This is a part of our civilization. I'm not sure whether we are all aware in this room, but in Poland today we have more than 100,000 drones registered and flying. I'm not referring to toy drones, a drone that I bought to, for my child. I'm talking about drones that perform specific tasks day by day. You should treat a drone as a robot operating mid-air. It's flying software. There are more than 80 AI applications to perform certain actions automatically. There is a drone measuring level of methane without intervention of people or other vehicles in hardly accessible locations. If we consider the availability of a drone that can be suspended 24 hours a day, 
they use very little energy to perform such flights and to measure levels of certain elements. Just as we have robots at home, like robotic vacuum cleaners, we're going to have more such robots in the air, for instance, in the United States, a number of functions in the industry are performed using a drone. I drove a highway in the United States and I received a fine for exceeding the driving limit there. Kerfer, for instance, selected 26,000 products that they would like to deliver by drones by 2026. So these processes have already started in companies, and companies recognize benefits of using drones. I can only encourage you to contact us, discuss things with us. Please join our testing and trials, and we will show you how you can measure uh, the leakage of methane using drones, for instance. And then customers will learn how to do that. You can do it with us using modern solutions. If I count well, several minutes are left for our panel. So instead of individual questions, I would like to ask just one question addressed to everyone. One of the topics refers to modern technologies and their contribution to the improvement of the level of security, cyber security, including in the industry. Maybe uh, these are sensitive elements of our infrastructure that uh, we've developed. What is the influence of new technologies? Very concise answers, please. You actually included an answer in your question. The development of technology, globalization of the technology sector proceeds too slow to catch up with the development of cyber security. It's the fact. We have a fast development of technologies and cyber security cannot match the pace of development and artificial intelligence. There is no product based on AI in the area of cyber security uh, that could be efficient. I don't know what can I do to be concise. The topic is very broad. There is no way out from automation and the use of equipment that we've referred to in the context of the infrastructure confronting the infrastructure with cyber security. Krzysztof and I will have just more and more work. And this will stay with us for a number of years because there's no other way out. You're fighting with the monsters, right? Well, considering the rate of developing new systems, systems related to cyber security and systems related to the IT sector, they may pose certain threat because of the shortage of competences. There is shortage of people who can safely introduce these systems in companies. And just as previous speakers have said, this is the only way for us, and we need to do our best to remember about security and consider it while implementing systems that theoretically are not related at all to security.
Szanowni Państwo, nowoczesne technologie powstają. Modern technologies are developed because there is tremendous demand for it, for them, resulting from growing consumption and shortage of resources. I agree that no one will be able to stop the process, so technology companies will never decide to stop. Every technology company has their plans at least three or five years ahead and we're going to live in metaversum in the digital world in parallel to the real world. Don't ask me how. This means that digital competences is the major challenge for us. Everyone, not only technology companies, should have such competences. Students, your children and you, yourself, should be prepared to live in the digital world. Period. Let's hope that it's not the in, we are not end up with insane metaverse. Yesterday I prepared a document for my boss and I read a lot about quantum computers. It's, it's a solution already available commercially, but one of the conclusions drawn might be that quantum computers in five or six years will erase contemporary cryptography. And what? Next, this might be a good question. We referred to cloud computing and several years ago the Internet of Things was hardly imaginable and now we have robots at home. One of my colleagues dealing with cybersecurity tested a robot and data from the robot flow to the cloud to the manufacturer and he sent information or request to the manufacturer what type of data uh, have you been collecting? And there is no, there was no answer to the question. So something that uh, Wojciech Zajchowski mentioned. Cyber security find it hard to catch up with the development. Let's use innovative solutions, but it, let's also use specialists in the area of cyber security. I will have to discuss it with my Roomba. Well, it seems to me that the threat is there with any change, the change, be it the change of technology, uh, the way we live, the way we eat. We need responsible people who will assume this responsibility. And there are real opportunities. Maybe it's kind of boring, but in drone emergency systems, when an ambulance approaches a location of an accident, we can use our drones to provide a video picture and sound in real time. So things that may happen after the ambulance arrives at the site can start much earlier, and this is a tremendous opportunity. There are threats. The threats can be mitigated, but there are a number of advantages. And it's difficult for me to add anything since I speak as the last one. Almost everything has been said. Perhaps there's one more thing. In the area of commerce, we're going to follow new technologies, but there's a big gap in education. And we need to balance that as well. We need to start with the level of technical schools, moving upward 
to będziemy mieli problem, że za chwilę nie będziemy mieli kadry. Very soon we will have a significant shortage of specialists. So people now at the age of 40 plus It's difficult for them to, to find people to be trained. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your comments. I'd like to thank attendees for staying with us. This is the end of our panel, and I'd like to invite you to our next panel, which is going to start shortly. Dziękuję bardzo za bardzo ciekawy, ciekawy panel. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. I was a victim of a cyber attack na system sterowania kolejni koleją. The railway system control, railway control system, and instead of traveling three hours to Oslo, it took me eight hours. Ostatnim panelem, The final panel. zgodnie z tradycją, na Gastermie zawsze również występują prawnicy. I właśnie ostatnie panel during Gaster, we have lawyers performing during the last panel and prospects for gas as a transition fuel in the context of the current methane strategy and the EU taxonomy. Adam Wawrzynowicz is going to moderate uh, the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, let me briefly tell you about the issues to be discussed. Emission cost, natural gas in the taxonomy, emission thresholds, financing of investment in gas-based energy industry, hydrogen and biogas technologies, growing importance of hydrogen and biogas technologies toward climate neutrality until 2050. Investment in hydrogen and biogas technologies at an early development stage as support for energy transition, importance of ecosystem supporting the development of technologies and current barriers. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Wawrzynowicz. It is my pleasure to moderate the final panel today. The panel, which is going to be the last one during our conference. Let me kindly request panelists to take their seats. Let me invite Jakub Kowalski, member of board for operations, PSG. Krzysztof Chnatio, Tauron Polska Energia. Profesor Jakub Pokrzywiak, WKB Lawyers Firm. I poprosiłbym również pana. Bartłomieja Bartłomień Mazurkiewicz, Pegnik Ventures. PGNAG Ventures. Dzisiejszy panel, Today's panel, dzisiejszy panel poświęcimy is going to focus on the use of gas as a transition fuel, which is a very valid 
topic in the context of current developments. Developments taking place in Europe, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, and economic and political consequences of the fact. Porozmawiamy chwilę o We're tym, going jak to discuss tą how to collate this strategy that we've been developing for quite some time, no, co tu dużo mówić, lobując też while za lobbying ziemny, for natural gas, żeby można było gaz ziemny to be able to use it to reduce do, do emission in the industry, to Także ensure low emission and to eradicate smog and we will try to discuss whether these projections forecast are still valid. Jeżeli chodzi o polskie stanowisko, as regards the Poland's position regarding gas, this is defined in documents developed before the 24th of February this year. No, ale bardzo konsekwentnie polska administracja and tutaj Polish administration na gaz ziemię, methodically focused on natural gas as a transition fuel in the energy Ten gaz transformation miał nam process. The gas was supposed to provide for the reduction of emission from the overall economy and to make our products more competitive on European and global markets. Oczywiście przy określonych warunkach i przez provided certain przez, conditions przez, are met no, jednak ograniczony czas and gdzieś for na końcu tego procesu mamy gospodarkę and zero emisyjną of that process we can see zero emission perspektywę czyli po kolei economy można spojrzeć sobie jak to ewoluowało and tak, this is how it evolved the na national na energy and climate plan 2019 Polityka energetyczna Polski the energy policy z perspektywą 2040 until 2040, which specified that natural gas is the transition fuel Pierwszego marca on the 1st of March 2022, where we also indicate natural gas as a leading fuel in the process of the transformation of the Polish economy, which is going to be replaced with more environmentally friendly fuels. From the EU perspective, natural gas was seen slightly differently and for people from the gas sector uh, could see worrying signals coming from Brussels. The methane strategy were much, much earlier than the latest political developments have taken place. They indicated that natural gas would be fuel which is going to be equal to coal in certain areas and should rather be eliminated from the economy because the EU as a whole depends much on the imports of gas in particular from Russia and from other countries. We do have the methane strategy, which requires us to calculate emission. We enter the hazardous path in terms of natural gas, and in the context of conclusions to the EU legislation, this can be clearly seen. There is a draft methane regulation, which is a part of the decarbonization uh, packages. To wszystko pokazuje nam, że te podejścia all this shows that the Polish and European approaches have not always, were not always convergent. 
And the recent development in Ukraine require us to revise strategic goals at the level of Poland and the EU. And this is what I would like to discuss with our guests. The first question let me address to Jakub Kowalski, representing PGNAG, or representing the PSG, because the crucial element of becoming independent from energy resources from beyond the European Union are renewable gases and the integration of these gases with our gas distribution system. The question is whether PSG, the Polish gas company, recognizes the trend and are you prepared to use the gases like biomethane and uh, hydrogen to integrate? Council, of course, the PSG, the Polish gas company, has been recognizing these processes and these trends for quite a long time. As for biogas, we have been issuing uh, connection conditions for Polish biogas, biogas plants. We still do that. Unfortunately, none of these biogas plants has signed the connection agreement and uh, none of them has started to feed their biogas to our distribution network operated by us. And we have uh, all the grid codes, uh, technical capabilities and competences to receive this biogas. I have an impression that these works at the Ministry of Climate have stalled uh, on the support scheme for biogas plants. There was a discussion earlier today that the National Environmental Protection Fund can initiate certain support programs, which is very much needed, because it appears that the possibility to receive additional funding, for example, for biogas conditioning, is one of the barriers for biogas plants. As for hydrogen, we are currently at the research stage. We have a research project testing our networks in various parts of Poland and uh, various ages or various periods of installation, and we are testing uh, the transportation of hydrogen in those networks. Uh, of course, we want all new networks, gas networks of the PSG company to be built in such a way that they can accommodate hydrogen. And we would need some support, not only from the government, or, uh, organ, uh, sorry, government administration, but as mentioned earlier, we would like to use, we would like to see certification mechanisms for PE pipes, because we would like to use them for transportation of hydrogen. So someone should start thinking about adequate certification for the pipeline manufacturers, even if there are support schemes and funds available um, to be used by our company. Eventually, we will have to be able to prove that what we have built is a hydrogen pipeline that the, the EU or the European Commission had in mind. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't only use German certification bodies or systems. So there is a number of challenges or problems to be solved, but we have already discussed this matter with one of the leaders of the Polish energy sector and we will build the first hydrogen pipeline. It will be a research project for now, but the pressure of time in this project is, or the timeline of the project is rather ambitious, so we will soon be able to transform our words into reality and to see how it works in, real, in the real world. Everyone is aware that uh, transporting hydrogen is n will not be very easy. It's not about uh, materials, but also welding technologies and all the 
technologies in the network should be suited to preventing escape of hydrogen. There are some installations that uh, cannot even transport hydrogen at a distance of one meter because their molecules are so small that uh, it's very easy for them to leak or escape. So uh, then we have the questions of uh, uh, hydrogen production capacities and volumes so that we have something to actually transport in our networks. Uh, we are talking about theoretical things and practice may look completely different. When we talk today with the companies who are supposed to generate, produce hydrogen, they are also facing significant problems and the R&D projects are not at the stage of advancement that we would all wish to see. Thank you very much for this answer. From the point of view of PSG, perhaps methane-based gases like biomethane could be closer to your activity. It would be the most natural gas to consolidate or integrate with the existing network. And perhaps there are purely regulatory problems appearing. We will talk about that in the second round of questions, unless you want to uh, reveal something already now with regard to um, the main obstacles for the biomethane market to develop as much as we expected it some time ago. We expected we had expected that you would see a lot of biomethane plants as early as 2020. At PSG, we had numerous discussions, and uh, there are some situations where we met with the other stakeholders in the right place. There are some discussions uh, related to the calorific value uh, specified in our grid codes. The market believes that these values should be different, uh, but we are safeguarding these values from our grid codes. But we'll see what uh, the future brings. With regard to our internal regulations at the Polish Gas Company, we are ready. The question is about the response from the market. When uh, stakeholders would like to sign the first connection agreement, whether there will be enough substrate to generate biogas and to feed it to the distribution grid, or perhaps they will consume that biogas for their own co-generation purposes. The behavior of the market in the nearest months will certainly demonstrate uh, these tendencies, these trends. You have mentioned that the war has caused significant changes in the behaviors of our clients, especially individual consumers. If we compare the first quarter of this year with the previous year, the drop in interests uh, in getting connected to the gas network among individual customers is significant. So this may mean that this transformation will accelerate due to these geopolitical factors. It is certainly visible among individual customers. They look for other solutions and they think twice before they apply for gas network connection. And this trend is visible month on month and we cannot see any breakthrough yet and return to what we had last year. It may affect business clients as well who may have different ideas about their relationships with gas and ourselves as the distribution system operator. So we are following the market, we are following the statistics and we are trying to adjust our strategy of operation and our priorities. So far, our pri one of our priorities is uh, our business customers and the heating sector. Uh, regardless of what has been said, despite what has been said in the previous panels, the heating sector uh, does not see many other solutions than getting connected to the distribution Gas, net, the gas distribution network, and they go, uh, they apply for connections that go well beyond our financial capabilities. Well, if possibilities, capabilities are uh, limited, there might be slightly less gas in the system in the nearest perspective, there is such a risk, and the directions of development, for example, towards district heating, 
co wydaje się tak This is something that seems the most reasonable as of today to focus on connections that are the most effective in terms of scale. Yes, that's why at PSG we are focusing on this sector and we emphasize that neither PGNIG group nor Orlen in the future uh, and uh, PSG as such is unable to handle that uh, with regard to connection needs of the district heating. And even if it happens that some of them go in the direction of heat pumps, as mentioned by Mr. Piotr Dziadzio, and those smaller heating plants may uh, consider such possibilities, the demand on the part of large stakeholders, large heating units, is significant enough uh, that we need to think about support schemes and financing schemes, funding schemes uh, with the share of the Polish state. So we need external funding. Without the support of the National Environmental Protection Fund, we are unable to connect a large district heating systems to the gas network. Let me, let me mention the regulatory issue for methane. We are at the eve of significant changes in the RES Act. We have the uh, UC-99 draft. We are at the last stage of notification of the amendment to the system regulation with regard to biogases. We are talking about SOX and oxygen, so we might uh, discuss uh, whether these parameters are sufficient for uh, stakeholders who want to get connected to the grid. But this step has been already taken. So we are one step further towards regulatory foundations required to develop the entire biomethane segment. One thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but this is also due to the most recent regulatory tendencies, most probably it will be necessary to rebuild the distribution tariff system so that there is something similar to the entry-exit system uh, as is the case for transmission networks to calculate profitability levels uh, with regard to connection applications. Now, a question to Mr. Krzysztof Hnatio from Tauron. You are smiling. You are not the CEO. You are director. You're a director. Uh, sorry about this mistake. And uh, from the point of view of a company that has significant coal-fired assets, how do you see the opportunities and threats related to coal? Will we see the coal come back due to the war in Ukraine? Or rather, this Transition towards gas will continue, will be the leading one, and there will be no changes here. Thank you very much for this question. I think that this mistake was not an accident. I did work for PGNIG uh, and I've been working with Tauron Polish Energy holding group for the last six months. So for many years I've been thinking about selling, how to sell gas to the energy sector. There's a significant problem about that. We were selling a lot of gas to the chemical industry, but there was always a problem with the energy sector. Now my role is to manage the investment process in the holding group of Tauron. So 24 companies uh, in the uh, the entire holding group in the energy sector. And my answer is we 
Bo do Państwo sami not widzicie, give up on coal. I've been listening to the discussions yesterday and today. We keep talking about what's going to happen in five years and seven years. And I have to think about tomorrow or one month from now, from the point of view of our projects, of our assets. How will I be able to provide electricity and heat to our clients, to our consumers that we have contracts with? And let me put it like this, from the point of view of running the investment process, we will build, we will build a gas-fired unit, and the procedure is ongoing, and I cannot reveal too many things, and there is a certain um, trade secrecy around it before the final, the final bids are submitted. But regardless of the fact that there is war in Ukraine, we want to build a gas-fired plant because they are, gas fire plants are the best stabilizing assets with regard to production of energy. Uh, some time ago, Tauron has made a green shift. We are building wind turbines, we are building solar PV plants, and to stabilize the work of wind farms, we need a flexible uh, source, a flexible generation unit such as gas fired unit. Together with PGNIG, we have a Stalova Vola power plant. We have the Stalova Vola power plant used to stabilize uh, the operation. But let me come back to your question. Today, we are thinking about long-term contracts with regard to gas supplies, contracts that you are going to enter. And there is no one in this room that could confirm the contracts that they are able to uh, enter into with companies such as Tauron, planning to have three or four coal, uh, gas-fired plants, I'm sorry, to replace coal units, but we need to consider the way we invest, reconsider the way we invest. In today's situation, means that the most certain thing at the time of war beyond the Polish eastern border, and let me convince you, it's only thanks to the fact that we still have coal in Poland, and the fact, thanks to the fact that we have coal-fired units and units that will continue to operate on coal for a long time, in my opinion, because today there is no alternative for the coming five years with regard to the build-out of new capacity to replace um, or to meet our energy consumption needs. So for Tauron, uh, we are holding group. We have our own coal sources. We have our own coal mines. They extract coal and they will think about how to provide coal to the Polish market. Because the taxonomy has introduced a certain regulation, a certain derivative financial instrument to suppress certain countries due to the different way that they uh, generate electricity, different than other countries who received funding earlier in the European Union to build out uh, wind or PV. Why am I putting it like this? Please note the CO2 prices during the, Polish, during the Russian Ukrainian war. There are very significant changes in CO2 prices. So, in the light of this, in countries such as Poland, uh, investments in coal mines were suppressed, and the EU has uh, established a great corridor for imports of Russian or Ukrainian coal. So, Tauron does have, we do have our own coal mines for our own power plants, and we will not have to purchase a lot to continue to maintain our electricity and heat production. So, as I understand, it would be optimal to have regulations uh, allowing also coal to be treated as a transition fuel in the energy transition process for some time into the future.
możliwe. So that investing in coal-fired assets are still possible, if I understand you correctly. Na pewno się zmieni w tym zakresie. In my opinion, the EU's policy is going to change in that respect. If there will be yet another sanction packages against Russia, if it is introduced, let Jest w Polsce. Uh, let's imagine this situation. I know the transmission grid in Poland very well. If we assume that Germans do not import Russian gas and there is no gas from Slovakia via Slovakia to Germany, nor gas via Jamal and Nord Stream 1, this would mean that Poland has a huge shortage of gas because there is no possibility to purchase gas on, at any interconnection point because Germans have almost 85% of Russian gas. So even though we have gas interconnectors with Germany, we are unable to purchase gas or to import gas via Lasów or Malnow because that gas will be only consumed in Germany. We could only take gas from the Klaipeda terminal or possibly via Slovakia. But the question is, where does Slovakia take its gas from? It is also Russian gas that is transported to Germany and part of that pipeline's capacity is taken by Slovakia. So it is a huge challenge and a huge problem from the point of view of extending the period when gas will be used for transition. So, uh, in this extraordinary situation today, in this extraordinary situation in Europe, for the period of the war, we should forget taxonomy. Because it harms countries with conventional energy sectors. It is harmful to both the citizens and the economies of such a country. In that case, Poland. Thank you very much for this statement. For certain, we need to revise our approach to natural gas as the transition fuel and its place in the taxonomy. The question is whether such a goal is realistic. So to a limited extent in time and technology, perhaps coal can be placed there just as nuclear power and natural gas. In my opinion, it's very little possible, especially, and also in the context of the war in Ukraine, Maybe this transition will slow down, or already existing regulations will be removed, but it's not highly probable, though we should lobby for our interests and promote our interests in the EU. Just to complement one thing, I have previously Previously, I have not shown much interest in coal, but in Europe, you can hardly buy coal, and a country like Germany, focusing on green Germany, source coal from Colombia because they would like to implement their energy policy based on coal. No one uh, has said that uh, Germany do not produce cheap energy using lignite. They have resources of deposits of lignite and they do it. So Poland should not look through the taxonomy, get rid of energy resources that we have. It's not possible to increase the extraction of coal in just two months. It takes a year, a year and a half. That's why Poland looks for or searches for sources of coal because our energy sector is based, still based on coal. We referred to changes in regulations related to the aggression, Russian aggression to on Ukraine, let me ask Jakub Pokrzywniak, representing WKB. 
Jak, jakbyś mógł nam przedstawić tak, Jakub, could you please jak to wygląda tell us briefly about the, the current situation at the European level? Can we expect any changes there? Do they discuss revision of regulations pertaining to the energy sector and the gas sector? And possible directions of changes. What can we expect there? Thank you very much. From the perspective of a lawyer, and looking for some specific things, the discussion is ongoing. No conclusions have been reached. It's, the seven, it's already 17th of May. Perhaps tomorrow we can learn something more. Because tomorrow, according to press information, we're going to have the College of Commissioners that will put forward legislative proposals in the area concerned. There are a couple of interesting things. After the Russians' aggression, the Versailles Declaration was adopted by heads of state, and they, it covers a number of areas, including the energy sector. It's a short document written in a very vague diplomatic language, but they refer to the implementation of climate neutrality goals by 2050, let me quote, the current situation requires in-depth reassessment how to provide security of supplies. It's a very interesting phrase, in-depth reassessment. So it opens doors for discussions. This is something they think about. On the 8th of March, the European Commission publicized a communication which is not consistent. There are some specific things included, like guidelines based on Article 5 of the uh, Energy Directive and establishing of regulatory prices to protect uh, households, to protect off-takers. So perhaps the application of tariffs will be prolonged. It, the communication occupies just several pages, but there are some detailed solutions mentioned. The use of competitive forces as the optimum solution. From what you've said, I understand that we can expect a change regarding the removal of tariffs applicable to households in Poland. This also opens possibility of uh, having prices regulated in various countries. And then regarding storages, there is a draft document of the 23rd of March this year regarding gas supply security and interesting news. Since they mention intensive actions against competitive uh, activity of Gazprom. This is something specific in terms of law, but they draw attention to one thing. Low level of storage coverage, especially those controlled by Gazprom. So it's not a market behavior. We need to examine that more thoroughly. That's what the European Commission says. There are some headings that are not supported by any specific solution. Perhaps they will appear soon, like the increase in the production of biomethane, something that we've already referred to, and they point to the need uh, to adopt specific measures in terms of the Red 3 uh, directive. 
Dalej mówi się o zwiększeniu Then they discuss the possibility of using hydrogen uh, above goals and objectives of Fit for 55 and the hydrogen strategy. And I'd like to draw attention to this section. Let me quote. The Commission will develop regulatory framework to promote the European hydrogen market. So this is the pronouncement referring to some regulatory activity and support for the development of renewable energy sources and something that's interesting for us. The Commission calls member states to qualify renewable energy sources uh, and the use of the most favorable permitting procedures. According to these documents, no one says anything about the return to coal. It seems that the European Commission sees the current situation in such a way that a solution to the problem to become independent from the supply of gas from Russia should be to expedite the, the previous development. Uh, for instance, the development of renewable energy sources in a more intensive manner. Last year, during gas term, it was my pleasure to participate in the panel, and one uh, panelist claimed that the climate policy very often people complain about it in Poland, but in fact, it was a working against Russian interest. So the European Commission would like to expedite the process to become independent from Russian gas even faster. And of course, the taxonomy has also been mentioned. The draft regulation was adopted by the Commission on the 9th of March. This is the complete this is the delegated regulation that favors gas and nuclear energy. So the Council and the Parliament have two solutions, either adopt it or reject it. It's an interesting situation because this draft that was developed early this year and accepts further use of natural gas and nuclear power was developed before Russia's invasion, but it was adopted afterwards, so we cannot expect any revolutionary changes. In interesting, formally they do not refer to Russian gas, they just refer to natural gas as such, but it's a package. It means that we reject the support for the nuclear power. Uh, sector. According to some press articles, we see that Germany is unwilling uh, to do that, so I'm curious about the future development of the delegated regulation. So at the legislative level, something has happened, and there are various pronouncements of future actions, and we need to wait for some specific solutions, perhaps already tomorrow. So renewable gases, decarbonized gases, is the future for certain, regardless what happened in our immediate environment geopolitical environment. This direction will be maintained and regulations currently discussed and processed indicate that the process will expedite. This is what I understand as a lawyer. In reaction to what happened, we do not change the direction, but we try to expedite the process. But it's still open, because still we don't have any specific regulations in various areas, but at the level of declaration and the content of documents that have been publicized, uh, we cannot see any change in the direction of development. And of course, we have this package of decarbonization of natural gas and hydrogen markets. This is also a draft level, and solutions included there focus on 
zarówno w odbiorze, Expediting the process related to hydrogen and methane and to integrate the two gases. Let me ask Bartłomiej Mazurkiewicz, representing PGNIG Ventures. Jak państwo postrzegacie How do you perceive renewable decarbonized gases, biomethane, hydrogen? Can you see project, such projects in your activity? And to what extent, if there are, if they are there, to, are they in a more commercial rather than R&D phase? What is the situation on your part? Thank you very much for the question. To tell you how we perceive these projects, let me tell you what we've been doing. Because this appendix ventures to our name uh, may not be clear to everyone. Our task is to attract innovative solutions to the corporation and to generate profit based on that. Why do we do that? It's a model, it's a market-oriented model, already in 1990s and 80s, the source of innovation were corporations, large corporations like Dell, Intel, generated innovative solutions. Now these solutions are developed in small, agile, teams, startups, and you just need to reach for them, and corporations should, should reach out and integrate such technologies. And we do have examples of certain sectors which transformed much earlier, succeeded. For instance, the uh, telecommunications sector learned less, they lesson well, and they transformed. They gathered much experience. Sorry to interrupt you. Some of us are not familiar with your company, apart from the fact that you represent the PGNIG group. You're a sort of investment fund, corporate investment fund, focusing on new technologies and integrating the technologies within the group. Yes, this is what we would like to do. From a formal point of view, our first task is to generate profit. Second is to fit into the development and implementation of the strategy. And from a business point of view, we would like our every project to meet the two conditions at the same time. The benefit for the group is clear. We know that the time has come uh, for our sector to transform, and just as you've mentioned, judging by the documents adopted at the EU level in the face of war, we see that we do not slow down. We can rather expect that the process will expedite. That's why we look for innovation. We need to reach out for technological innovations and outsource them. Or seek such innovations beyond the group. Procedures and corporate governance in the previous century were enough for internally developed technologies to catch up with the market. Now the market develops too quickly. That's why agile teams develop technology transformation. And in our energy sector, the situation is even more difficult. We receive signals from the market and from politicians, and we can see that the this process has expedited. That's why we would like to invest in such technologies, technologies for the energy sector. I would love to ask another question, perhaps. I'm not sure whether you're able to respond to it. Have you managed to attract interesting technologies that you can tell us about in the area of biomethane or hydrogen? 
But to, że what is worth emphasizing, our group is open to transform and this will influence the quality of our projects. We focus on companies that already have business models, have ready-made technologies and they struggle to start generating profit and they apply or appeal to the energy sector to buy their solutions. We are integrated well with other business units within the group. We have an excellent support ecosystem. We have the Department of Business Development. They search for large projects, large investment. We have R&D department and we look for solutions in between. Smaller capital, smaller investment for technologies that are ready, technologies that need to be verified within the group. So our capital group can add a lot and help such investment, can help such technologies in their development. There is a well-known term in venture. Let me explain uh, the death by the concept verification. Corporations, industry in particular, considered for too long whether it's worth implementing such solutions. If a solution is not necessary, it's clear. But wherever we see some synergy, it's very important to act quickly. Corporations should act quickly, especially today when we see this accelerated transformation, because this will be a proof of concept. A proof that a technology can generate benefits for a corporation, and this is what we've been looking for. Responding to your questions, we have examples of technologies at a too early stage, and we use other business units in our ecosystem to follow, to test such solutions. For instance, in the biogas sector, there is a company that uh, has a technology, but not yet developed a business concept. We have a unit responsible for accelerating the process, and they organize this proof of concept process. They can even attract external financing to cover the cost of testing, and we, as the investment fund, are involved in the process. Process. If the corporation says the technology has proven to be effective and if it fits into our business strategy, we as the fund will be very much willing to invest. We acquire minority share, we benefit by transferring the technology to the group, we acquire minority stake, and this is a standard in our activity. We look for the win-win-win solution. The standard is verified by the market, and the partnership with a large company can uh, confirm or can bring the approval to the technology, and we have a package uh, that provides us with some supervisory activity. We control and we have rights that we wouldn't have at the market level. This is an example of one company that is tested, but in our portfolio we have a company dealing with cyber security and they have been testing their solution on the market. It's not easy for them because foreign solutions are better developed, so they have been trying to source contracts, but an advantage for the group in the area of cybersecurity for the group 
is that we would like to support the startup since we are an owner and in case of a cyber attack, an emergency situation, we can see a benefit for the group because this is a Polish technology. This is what I wanted to ask you about. I do not want to prolong our discussion and your intervention. Do you focus on Polish companies only? or you focus on the Polish local content, or perhaps you also cover companies operating in Europe and elsewhere in the world. So far we have three investment projects, 100% Polish. We have one foreign investor, but these are Polish teams, Polish technology, and 100% of the Polish content, but we can source such projects abroad. There are no limitations for us. I think this is the result of the demand expressed by the group. It is worth emphasizing while discussing such a corporate fund. The dialogue with the group is crucial. We are a bridge between a ready-made technology, which is not yet fully fledged in terms of business and the large industry. We need to know what the group needs and we need to address it with a technology that we source from the market. If we find a foreign technology, there is no problem for us to invest abroad. What you're saying is very optimistic because it means that there are already structures and a model to acquire those and develop those technologies. So it's all going in the right direction, as we've just learned. The next question goes to Mr. Kowalski. We have been talking a lot about biomethane, about hydrogen. And now the question is, were to take money for all this from, especially in a company like PSG, where the investment program is very ambitious and there's a lot of tasks, is there still any room, is there still any space to remove the bottlenecks and to implement investment projects aimed at pure integration of renewable gases. Is there still some funding available in the light of uh, Phoenix or the Energy Transformation Fund? Is there still an, some room for that? Is there still any money we can take this money f uh, to speed up this transition. We are at the stage of moving from the general to details. And the main assumptions, outlines of the Phoenix program will be now precisely defined. So we want to have, we want these funds to be available for modernization of PSG's assets, network assets. And we would like to have a program where each modernization project is done in such a way that we can use admixture gases, biogas, hydrogen. And we would also like to be covered by the Energy Transition Fund, and we want to have a better cooperation and better recognition by the National Environmental Protection Fund. Many of you have heard about the, our communications from the beginning of this year, where we announced that we ex uh, exhausted the, uh, the budget budget uh, for investment projects, and this announcement has made, uh, has caused uh, discussions with very many of our partners. So unfortunately those who were so eager to pick up the phone are not that eager uh, anymore, but we tell them that gas and distribution networks should be covered by the modernization fund established by the National Environmental Protection Fund, because there is power industry and heating industry and gas distribution is not there. And uh, all documents say that it is the gas distribution networks uh, 
that will be the basis of the transition period and gas uh, as a transition fuel, but everyone forgot about the financing of these gas distribution networks. So we are actively participating in this process and we want to provide input to these discussions with the National Environmental Protection Fund. We carried out a lot of work, we've done our homework to demonstrate how our projects could be funded, but we're also fighting for legislative changes because uh, we believe that our under a higher connection fee, or perzebbia. perhaps 100% con con connection fee in case of some stakeholders or some consumers, uh, we should be able to recover those costs. Uh, with the rising costs uh, of connection, an individual uh, customer participates at the level of 19% in the connection cost. Among business customers, the, that level is similar. And such an off-taker could use funds from the National Environmental Protection Fund to acquire funding to build a gas connection. So it would be good for that connection fee to reflect the actual costs and uh, to have external funding. If we believe that if funds subsidize gas connection build-out, then this money should uh, reach our uh, company and we should have the possibility to have a 100% connection fee. We have proposed such a change. We are quite quite advanced with the discussions with the Ministry of Climate, but the Energy Regulatory Office blocked, decided to block that initiative, and we have been discussing this with the ERO for several months now, trying to explain that the macro situation has changed significantly. The ERO refers to its position of 2010, uh, referring to a certain consensus back then, but quite a lot has happened since 2010, so there is uh, any consensus developed back then is outdated and, uh, today. Some time ago we said that coal should be phased out, now we are already considering whether it will really be the case. One month ago no one expected Ukraine to be able to win the war with Russia, and today there is more and more people saying that it could happen. So what the future will bring, we do not know, but all previous Mm, consensus, uh, agreements or statements should be revised today. And we should start the discussion and should continue our discussions with the ERO and the Ministry of Climate to discuss the mm, operation of the mm, procedure for connections to the gas network. So times have changed and we should check whether our tools are relevant. We believe that they are irrelevant. Uh, perhaps the directors from the ERO believe that everything is fine and we should operate based on previous well-known models. And when we tell them that our budget is not made of rubber and that we cannot acquire funds to carry out our projects, we hear from the ERO that similarly to gas system, we should take out loans uh, every year and they will tell us how to do it. We believe that it is not the right model or the relevant model that we should use as the Polish gas company. So changes in the tariff uh, system, not only for distribution itself, but for connection process as well. If we are to carry out a quick transformation of the gas system to integrate uh, renewable gases. Yes, certainly, and we have prepared certain initiatives, and I hope they will for, foil, uh, fall on the fertile ground quite soon. Uh, there are billions, dozens of billions of slotties uh, with regard to the modernization fund. Uh, do you assume that some part of those funds will be available for gas distribution? We are explaining that it should be the case, because otherwise we will not be able to bear the cost of both modernization of existing networks and the cost of build-out of new networks or gas connection. For example, Veolia in which they want to connect their gas-fired unit 
Until 2027, 700 meters of connection pipeline, we have to build 61 kilometers of uh, gas network uh, at the cost of one, uh, 330 million zlotys, this one project. The Ministry of Climate is asking us uh, how, uh, how are we are doing. Uh, it is an important part of the capacity market and they do not want to lose this player in central Poland. And in response, we are asking about uh, support for for our connection activities. Because if we include all the projects, we are talking about billions. So today, without systemic solutions, we are unable to cope with these challenges. Slowly we are moving forward, and I hope that these systemic solutions will be put in place. Thank you very much. I'd like to... Well, we have touched upon uh, the topic of connection of generation units to the grid, like Veolia's unit. What about Tauron? What does it look like in case of Tauron? If you could reveal a bit uh, about your investment projects. Did you also have such problems with access to the gas grid, to the gas network? And what is the current stage of investment projects related to gas-fired generation units? Certainly at Tauron, we do not only look from the point of view of maintaining our coal-fired plants, because as, men as I mentioned earlier, we have three um, C, uh, uh, gas and steam turbines, yeah. CCGT ter, uh, units, and we are also looking for alternative fuels like RDF. Uh, you've mentioned the heat pumps in smaller towns. If we do not have a guarantee uh, to connect uh, highly efficient cogeneration, if there's no possibility to the uh, distribution, gas distribution network, well, it depends whether it is distribution or transmission. For example, if it's gas engines, highly um, efficient cogeneration, uh, then distribution network. If we are talking about highly efficient uh, combined cycle gas turbines, uh, CCGT, um, several hundred megawatts, then it will be gas system, because we are talking about connection for, our, for one of our projects, we will know the results at the end of December, because the current uh, tendering procedure for uh, the supply of turbines is ongoing. And then we will apply for the capacity market to uh, receive the price per megawatt hour. Now, what we should mention. Why did I say that it was possible to extend the operation of coal-fired units? Perhaps we will not have to wait to shift to gas. Perhaps we could move immediately to SMRs, to modern uh, nuclear technologies, uh, SMRs. Tauron has signed a Memorandum of Understanding, and you probably noticed that, a Memorandum of Understanding with KGHM, with the copper company, about uh, development and installation and deployment of uh, SMRs. It is a novel technology, but we are thinking about replacing coal-fired units without transition through gas, depending on the policy of the European Union, because SMRs, small modular reactors, are currently on the green list of the European Commission. So they are allowed by the European Commission to be used for electricity and heat generation. But let me mention yet another benefit of the existing coal-fired units. Tauron has its affiliate uh, uh, company uh, tower on heating. So if there is a problem with connecting small uh, consumers to uh, the gas network, then we have district heating or system heating. In Silesia, we have a very large heating network. It is one of the largest heating networks in Poland with regard to district heating. 
and then we would like to use district heating, cogeneration or waste incineration. Perhaps it's an unpopular topic, but it is a potential source of heat because in large urban areas we may have 30 to 50 megawatts of heat generation. So we can see such a possibility. And gas fired uh, plants uh, that we are talking about, we expect to have co-firing with hydrogen. They have a possibility of co-firing with hydrogen. But in a certain period of time, it was, uh, it was uh, an idea from gas storage Poland. To think about the use of hydrogen, you need to think about storing hydrogen, where to store hydrogen to use it on an industrial scale. Because I cannot imagine that someone would send hydrogen via an urban area to a power plant. In my opinion, it will take a lot of time. So the question is, where could we store hydrogen? You probably know, all of you, you can store it in containers. You can generate it, you can produce hydrogen uh, via electrolyzer to be used in buses or uh, passenger cars, but not for power plant. For power plants, we need enormous storage facilities for hydrogen, because you you need to calculate the volume of hydrogen needed for a 450 megawatt unit. And where could we have large scale hydrogen storage? You need to look at Poland geology. Only in salt deposit areas. Uh, so it's only there. It's not possible to store hydrogen in uh, depleted coal mines or coal deposits. So we can talk about hydrogen and industrial scale use of hydrogen in a certain perspective, we can use hydrogen for passenger cars, for buses or for trains, that's a small scale, but not for large scale power generation. Uh, to feed hydrogen directly to power plants. You know that hydrogen is not the same thing as methane. So, even in Germany, there are still no transmission pipelines for hydrogen. And there is there is also no single large-scale hydrogen storage. There are only research projects for storage of hydrogen. And this will be of key importance to the use of hydrogen. And what I have mentioned earlier, what can we offer to our heat and power consumers today for the coming winter? And this, we have this offer to our customers. Tauron has uh, their own uh, sources, their own units. We can use electricity generated uh, in wind farms, in PV projects. We have some research projects for hybrid generation and the use of hydrogen and uh, the support of PV and wind farms. But I didn't mention one more thing, one more source. We call it a very safe and very valuable source. That is water, hydro. So we say we have renewables projects, wind, solar and hydro. We want to build energy storage facilities, not uh, with a capacity of 3 megawatts, uh, but for 750 megawatts. It would be a pumped storage power plant, which is real electricity storage facility. And we are considering such projects. Uh, I cannot talk about many of them because they are at the stage of research, but they are on, only becoming part of our strategy that is yet to be announced, so I am not authorized to talk about them. But I'm just indicating the directions for Tauron uh, and the energy mix that Tauron will be using as a company with the majority stake of uh, 
stakeholders, that's 50 shareholders of our company, 51%. 30% is the state treasury stake, it's a control stake. But we need to find solutions working to the benefit of consumers who want to use this energy. And this Tauron has a broad portfolio of various sources, diverse sources. So we can expect you to be ready, to be prepared to provide electricity and heat at affordable prices in a secure manner. So the future is bright. Well, we will not be able to build a gas-fired unit without a guarantee of a long-term gas supply contract. This, this is impossible at a price that is acceptable from the point of view of NPV and IRR over time. If we look at the market, uh, at the coal market, it's not the, a time of stable situations and long-term forecasts. Jakub. I have a question to you regarding your forecasts regarding the impact of economic sanctions that we have mentioned numerous times already. The impact of sanctions on the gas market and on Poland's economy and the resources of fuel market based uh, on uh, Russian imports to a large extent. Thank you very much for the question. It refers to what the previous speaker has said. Concluding a long-term contract for the supply of gas in the current circumstances bears additional risk. There is no idea to introduce sanctions on Russian gas at the EU level. Moreover, if we analyze, I need to interrupt you. We haven't said one thing that this decarbonization package contains provisions limiting the possibility to make long-term contracts for natural gas. This could have been seen before. Nevertheless, the decision to develop gas-fired sources requires certain certainty of supply at the level of the Repower EU program. The direction is to reduce dependency on Russian gas, at least what, this is what the European Commission indicates. More than 40% of important gas is Russian gas, and other suppliers deliver less than 10%. So it would be, I'm just a lawyer, but I imagine that it's going to be difficult to replace that gas overnight. So the approach is to reduce the dependency gradually, and regulation that introduces sanctions is crucial. This is the regulation of 20 2014, it was amended uh, after the annexation, it was uh, produced after the annexation of uh, Crimea. Various sanctions are imposed on, for instance, pipes, but they do not apply to pipes necessary to transport natural gas and oil from Russia or through Russia to the European Union. There is an exclusion. There is a ban on investing in Russian companies unless it is necessary to provide crucial supply of gas and oil from Russia or through Russia to the European Union. So at the EU level, the approach is to reduce the flow of gas from Russia, but to maintain it for as long as 
possible unless, until other sources of energy uh, are available. I'm curious about contracts for natural gas from the point of view of the sanction clauses and force majeure clauses in the context of what's going on. These sanctions are not something unimaginable at the moment, and this influences security of business ventures based on gas. There is a huge question mark there, and the European Union does not push, uh, does not push, uh, push for radical solutions regarding Russian gas. So the impact on the EU economy uh, needs to be reduced from the point of view of sanctions. So the sanctions should have least in the least impact on the EU economy. Well, yes, this is also my understanding, and perhaps this is a question of political decisions at a much higher level, but at the level of these regulations, they are not a part of the energy policy. This is an element of a common foreign and security policy. Of course, these policies need to be correlated but technologies that contribute to the development of uh, the energy sector in Russia are covered by the sanctions, but pipelines that are needed to transport gas to the EU, not. This is something unbelievable that we have a regulation imposing sanctions that was amended several times uh, since 2014. In the year 2014, from the point of view of a lawyer, there was not much interest regarding these sanctions. These regulations were in place and they were applied. Their application varied in different EU member states. And for the past two months, we've been doing nothing else but to uh, examine these regulations. We have an opportunity to cooperate with an American law firm specializing in sanctions. They have a very serious approach to sanctions. They've been in the area for 10 years now, and they employed 40 lawyers there in the team. A question to Mr. Mazurkiewicz. We've mentioned the regulatory framework from your perspective. What is the regulatory architecture? for your activity. Is it sufficient or something is missing in these regulations? Perhaps you'd like to share some ideas and suggestions to change something. Regulations are not, a, are not bar barriers for us. However, these are these have serious impact on startups. We cooperate with a startup which, based on the dialogue with startups, examine major barriers in the development of technologies for the energy sector. And what we hear most often is that there are too frequent legislative changes, too many discussions, and too little specific, uh, too few specific decisions, concrete decisions. So two years of uncertainty for a startup frequently means that they won't be able to continue the operation of the market if the law changes too fast or it is uncertain. This is the issue which is most often raised regarding the energy sector. Another important issue raised by startups are investment targets. 
is the cooperation with the industry and looking for innovation in energy technologies. The industry hampers the development of startups. Their cooperation and support to young companies in terms of verification of their technologies is something very important. When the cooperation takes too long, procedures are prolonged. From the point of view of a corporation, nothing wrong happens, everything is in line with procedures. So the perception of time in different organizations differ. Yes, and it is crucial. I understand corporations and their mechanisms but from the point of view of our investment targets and young teams, startups, these procedures bring those young companies to an end. We came into contact with a company that has a solution for the extraction business, but procedures take so long that financial rounds are insufficient for them. Perhaps that's why they need you. No, I don't think so. Regarding the first barrier, perhaps yes. The responsibility for legislation, the legislators should be blamed for that. Whereas the second part, the industry, the understanding of the context of expedite transformation where there is no balance with the supply of technology and demand for it. The supply of technology should be ahead of demand. And in a sense, we deviate market rules that were present in the sector, and we can see it in the IT sector. There's no problem. The transformation, digital transformation progresses very fast and changes our companies, whereas the transformation in the energy sector, which has not never encountered anything like that, there is a different story regarding testing. Many funds do not want to invest in hardware. These are difficult projects, difficult from the point of startups and much more risky from the point of view of investment funds. So financial investors are rather unwilling to support technologies that require industry to start operating on the market. And this is the role of corporate funds which should fill the gap and facilitate the entry of startups to the industry. We've heard it a lot. Once startups go past the barrier, the situation is quite good. Companies which manage to successfully cooperate with the industry and scale up they're doing well in terms of investment and business. The energy sector has its specific nature, difficult entry and a large scale once the entry is done. Well, so those who will be able to adapt will survive, concluding my intervention. It's a very important barrier. Large corporations in the energy sector will try to lower the barrier and try to make the entry easier than the supply of technology will be larger in terms of hydrogen and biomethane technologies. If corporations reacted better to young technologies, this would help the development. When we test what's available within our country regarding hydrogen technology, there are several projects that are prepared for investment, the storage of hydrogen or perhaps
produkcji wodoru, w sensie production of hydrogen, elektrolizer. Bardzo dziękuję. Właśnie. The elektrolizer. Na przykład my w Polsce nie znaleźliśmy i nie ma spółki, która In Poland we cannot find a company offering new solutions regarding electrolyzers. We found such a company in the United States, so we can see that our market, which is obvious, it's a natural consequence of our history. That there are fewer startups, but it's good that you do not refrain to the Polish market because at the end of the day, it's a question of the technology itself and whether it can be used for the benefit of the Polish industry. We almost completed our time, uh, completed the time framework allocated for our panel. We have distinguished experts in our panel, so perhaps not a round of questions, but if you could provide your brief comment, what you would expect from the public administration to make the life of your organizations or the industry that you represent things went better than at the moment. I can see that Mr. Kowalski has an easy answer. We just need 42 billion zlotys indexed with inflation and the increase in prices on the market. This is the only our problem. The funding would help solve us the problems of the gas distribution system in the country. You just, director, over to you. Well, we seriously think about hydropower, so we perhaps all environmental procedures can be reduced, as said by Polish waters. Probably this will be announced at CIREP.pl. The question is whether we would like to develop green energy or conventional energy, nuclear energy, for instance. I believe the future for us to provide energy security of the country, we need a mix based on SMRs, the American technology, so the diversification also in this area. Yes. Jakub? I'm in a difficult situation because I do not represent any specific energy company, but as a lawyer dealing with uh, public bodies, I can produce a long list of suggestions and wishes, but Tego, czego ja bym jako, jako prawnik, więc mówię to bardzo skromnie, I, as a lawyer, and my expectations from the public administration would be to show much broader overview of the situation of the market. We've been discussing the uncertainty of the energy market, not only gas market, and the president of the consumer protection office has two cases against companies that I'm familiar with regarding products addressed to consumers, the guarantee of a fixed price. So you would like to have the regulatory certainty. It seems various accusations are formulated regarding clauses included in contracts, but from a broader point of view, these products seem to be useless for quite some time, especially because of the competition of the market and contracts with the guarantee of price for 24 months are a value for consumers. So all other constraints imposed on consumers would be perceived differently. 42 billion zlotys, simplification of pro investment procedures, regulatory certainty regarding 
Consumer yeah. Protection yeah. Office yeah. and yeah. the Energy yeah. Regulation yeah. Office. Yeah. And yeah. over to you. Yeah. I would say more flexibility yeah. regarding yeah. financing of projects yeah. at an early yeah. stage. Yeah. Uh, funding yeah. sources yeah. are many yeah. and they yeah. support yeah. young yeah. teams, yeah. young yeah. startups. Yeah. But maybe your company is also responsible for this uh, flexibility to a certain extent. From our point of view, it's not a problem because we uh, do not uh, have to have an agreement with our target company. Um, when a startup applies for funding to the uh, NCBR, uh, and any change, even though reasonable in the context of final, final results during specific stages of uh, research, is very difficult. And that's why R&D teams are focused on specific directions and the results of their work may not be interesting from a market point of view. So I would apply for larger flexibility. I'd like to thank our experts. I'd like to thank attendees for patience and endurance of staying with us for that long. I couldn't even dream uh, such a large attendance at this hour. I'd like to thank organizers for inviting me. Let me give the floor to Professor Paczynski. Thank you very much. Let me comment what we've heard. The introduction of biomethane to the gas network is nothing new. Already in 2008, 15 years ago, I delivered a paper during a conference in Bydgoszcz. The question of funding you are not aware that the German gas system and Polish system differ. It would take me 15 minutes to describe the situation, but the cost of introduction of biogas into the Polish system would be much higher than in Germany. We need to be aware of that. And perhaps one more thing is the LS system. As you know, in Poland we have three systems of natural LS, LW and LE. LS is similar to biogas. And we could pump biogas through the LS network without any processing. This system operates only in the coastal strip, such as Kołobrzeg, um, Koszalin. Then we can process uh, biogas into biomethane, but it's costly. We can only partially process it or dose the gas and pump it into the system at the level of 15%, it would be cheaper because we would avoid developing costly installations. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you. It is my pleasure to conclude the official part of our conference. I'd like to invite you to a banquet at 7, accompanied by a music performance, and I'd like to invite everyone to attend the 26th Gustav Conference next year. Thank you very much.